Welcome back everyone, this is Dave from Cormorant Productions with my co-host Stacy here to talk about From Season 2, Episode 8, Forest for the Trees. The episode's description reads as follows. In their pursuit of the truth about the town, Jim and Randall hatch a dangerous plan. Meanwhile, a new form of terror is brewing. The episode was directed by Brad Turner. Four episodes overall for Mr. Turner. He was the director of the last episode. The episode was written by John Griffin and Vivian Lee. Before going further, I'll tell you a couple of things. One, this is not a spoiler free podcast. If you haven't watched the episode, I highly recommend you go and check it out, and then come back and give us a listen. Secondly, if you are listening on one of the platforms that this podcast is now available on, please follow, and feel free to check out my YouTube channel, Corman Productions, where additional content can be discovered. If you're already on my YouTube channel, please like, share, and comment, and subscribe to our channel. All right, so there is one additional incentive to subscribe. Oh, geez. <laughs> yes, on Twitter, my co-host said that if we reached a million subscribers, she would eat a fried cicada live on air. So we just need 999,000 uh, more subscribers. <laughs> Not and, quite. Uh, no, yeah, a little bit less than that. Uh, I'm just pulling that number off the top of my head. But yeah. You know, you, you get subscribing. Good, anyway, good luck with that, Dave. All right, thank you. I thought that, I thought that would like you know provide some additional incentive for uh -huh. people to su uh, sure, subscribe. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so uh, before I get into my shoutouts, I actually want to talk about my first live tweeting experience. Yeah, so for the first time ever, yes. right? Yeah. Dave participated in the Sunday night live tweet, and I am so happy I did. It was a, <laughs> it was a fun time. My my hand was definitely hurting uh, by the time we were done. Uh, yeah. I actually had like a list of things I was gonna say like beforehand because I you know I watched the episode right. prior. It's impossible to do that yeah. on your first view. Right, right. It's impossible. <laughs> uh, I made some new friends, including uh, my new un completely unrealistic crush in <laughs> Carla Mack. Um, Carl Carla Mack is actually a Canadian-based actress. She's done a lot of voice work. Uh, she actually worked on. One of my favorite all-time series, The X-Files, uh, back in the day. day. So she's met a ton of people that I uh, used to know. Well, that I would love to have met. Right. Um, and maybe you will someday. Maybe. Some of them. Maybe. Possibly. Um, including D.B. Sweeney, who I was a big fan of back in the day. She worked on, specifically she mentioned that she worked on, as a background act actress, she didn't get any lines and therefore she wasn't credited. Uh, she worked on the fifth season finale of The X-Files titled The End, which featured an actor uh, who played the assassin in that series, Martin Ferrero, who was also in Jurassic Park as the lawyer, the character who uh, ends up getting eaten and is referred to as the blood-sucking lawyer. Um, I had no idea of that connection, and this is actually appropriate to bring up because Jurassic Park celebrated recently its 30th anniversary. Okay. Uh, also, there's a, bringing it back to the actual show that we're here to cover today, <laughs> uh, in that movie, Chaos Theory is brought up okay. by the character of Malcolm Ian. Uh, I think that's his name. I might be reversing a name, but the Jeff Goldblum character. And Chaos Theory is also brought up in this show. Yes. So I found that very interesting. Uh, she has a credit for Transportation Department. I'm actually not even sure what that does. I mean, I can guess. But uh, I, I think, think that, that means chauffeur, driver, yeah, maybe hauling people or stuff around. I think that I think uh, you know we should get her on and have her explain it to us. Uh, yeah. I mean, you already invited her. I did. So, I so did. Yeah, our our she, air is open. She is certainly a possibility for off season content. Okay, so now to my shout outs. Uh, we have Elizabeth Sanders who plays Donna. She liked the podcast. Uh, the link in the uh, on. Uh, See, so you got, you got, you're like so excited for your first live tweet. You want to like shout out everything that happened. Yes, yes. Every now, single thing. all of these people have week after week been participating in, in uh, liking and replying and retweeting my tweets. And um, I'll just say one more time, this whole cast is amazing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And they are so much more interactive than most casts in the fandoms I've been participated in. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been in a few like really awesome fandoms, but the Frumily is just really doing an amazing job yeah absolutely and uh like i said i was super jazzed after that i was so excited to come <laughs> on here and talk about this episode yeah, you can hear me talk about right. like these things happening but it's it's a 
whole other thing to experience yes. it yourself live. Right. <laughs> I, I honestly have slept horribly for days because I had just constant running commentary going through my head. Oh, uh, I about know. this episode so, and about this. Yeah. I mean, every week and for every week's in general, but particularly like we're getting to the point now where it's just like there's so much going mm-hmm. on, right? There's so much to talk about and, and theorize, yet, and and yet there is still people saying, "Oh, I, nothing happened." I know. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so much happened this, in this. You episode. know what? This show is not for everybody. Right, right. Puzzle box yeah. genre is mm-hmm. not for everybody. Right, absolutely. Um, but for those of you who are here. We are excited because we know you are in the same place we are, and you're feeling this. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, from Saturday night through Tuesday afternoon when we're done doing this, I'm not very productive in my real life. Because no? from is just kind of there. In your mind, between, constantly. Between the Facebook groups and the tweeting mm-hmm. and the rewatches and the note-taking, and just, it's in my mind the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, a shout-out for Elizabeth Moy, who shared the podcast. And suggested I might enjoy a crunchy cicada. And that, of course, led to the joke about uh, Stacy eating a live cicada on air. Well, not a live cicada. A fried cicada. She yeah. didn't agree to a live cicada. I, I would um, invite Elizabeth Moy to join me if we do that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she might be. She's the one who suggested it. Uh, Angela Moore, who plays Bakta but did not appear in this episode, liked and retweeted last week's podcast. Yes. Scott McCord who plays Victor, shared a, shared the podcast playlist that you shared. Yes, And he did. said he would give us a listen. And I appreciate that. And yes. if you are listening... Uh, Hi, Victor. Hi, Scott McCord. Scott, you're doing amazing. Yeah, Great. we... we you, your character of Victor is just unbelievable. Yeah, we, we are acting. big Victor fans on this show. Also, commenting on one of my tweets was Avery, Avery Conrad. And I'm almost tempted to, like, straighten out my sweatshirt and uh, say that Elgin has some competition... But, you know, my heart already belongs to another, and I'm not a player quite like Elgin. Plus, <laughs> plus, I could not help, I could not hope to match, you know, his game. You know, telling girls that he doesn't take baths and such. Um, <laughs> I, 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 Have you tried that route? <laughs> no, I, I have not. Uh, maybe that's, that's where I'm going wrong. Sorry, I, I, I got jokes this week, uh, so I'm going to be more unbearable than usual. Um, Latrice said that the monsters that can make you think you're losing your mind are scariest than forest monsters. She believes that what was going on with Elgin and throughout that episode signifies a new kind of monster. And honestly, I think this episode bears that out, that we have a new type of monster at play. Possibly Freddy Krueger uh, appearing in the next episode. Yeah. She made that joke on Twitter. She said I can make it during the podcast, and this seems as good a time as any. Yeah. Um, and... While you brought that up, I'll just go to one of my points. I do have a correction to make from last week. Okay. Which is now applicable to actually talk about because I am a horror fan. Yes. And something happened in last week's podcast. I don't know what happened. I need to redeem myself because it was like unforgivable for a horror fan to do what I did. So not once but twice in our last episode when I meant to say a nightmare on Elm Street, I said Friday the 13th, Mm -hmm. which... Yes, I know the difference. <laughs> I am a fan of both franchises. I am a bigger Friday the 13th fan, but uh, Nightmare on Elm Street is uh, something to talk about, right? Because we're there. We're living in a Nightmare on Elm Street situation right, now right. in this show. Yeah. Um, which makes it, you know, it makes me wonder that the bathtub scene uh, made me think of that last week. I wonder if that was uh, intentional. Intentional. It possibly. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to blame this on you, Dave. Okay. Because here's what happened. I'm going to explain myself. So last week, we were talking about your daughter, Julia. Okay. And what's appropriate for a 10-year-old to be watching, ah, right? Yes. Yep. And I started to say, when I was that age, I was watching Friday the 13th and A Nightmare on Elm Street. And that was going to be a great segue into me saying how this reminded me of a Nightmare on Elm Street, that okay. scene. But you interrupted me halfway through that thought. I'm sorry, that, that happens occasionally. <laughs> as soon as I Sometimes said... Sometimes it happens in reverse. As soon as I said, was watching Friday the 13th, I didn't spit out and A Nightmare on Elm Street. You interrupted, pointed to my Freddy Krueger shirt and said, oh. there, you're wearing it. So th- I skipped that step and never said A Nightmare on Elm Street. And I just said Friday the 13th, the rest of the conversation. Wow. Okay. My fault. It's your okay. fault. It's all your fault. Uh, you know, they, they say that to me at work all the time. It's all Dave's fault. And I'll take the blame here. Too. So, yes, there's no um, Jason Voorhees 
vibes going on. No, but we have, not yet. We got Friday the third. Uh, oh my god, we got Nightmare on Elm Street vibes. Freddy Krueger is 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 well and uh, in our minds with what's going on now. In I'm glad series. you corrected that just now, so you don't have to <laughs> next week correct yourself again. Words aren't my friend sometimes. Um, words are never my friend. Yeah. Especially the spoken word. Okay, so we also have a shout out for Dean G, who pointed out that the Boyd, uh, talk, talk, Boyd talked about the worms in the first season. Or he talked about worms. Talked about worms. Uh, yes. It was not the worms, but then right. you added to the conversation. So the, the it was mentioned in the first season. It was actually Sarah who mentioned it, mm-hmm. and uh, she she was what saying, "Do you think?" Because she was playing with the worms. This is when they were in the tent, and she goes, "Do you think they know where they are? You know that this is different than normal. Like, do they know they're in this creepy, weird place?" And and Boyd was like, "Do you know if when you?" cut a worm in half it becomes two worms and she goes okay what's your point and he said worms are freaky or mm. creepy or whatever the heck something, he said about something them. like that and that's his point and then of course that is foreshadowing that he now has these worms creatures you know right in, right in uh within i don't know six or twelve hours of when that happened for his character right yeah um that, so that was a good point um i didn't initially get what he was saying there but when you added to it, I think that might have been what he was trying to get at. Well, I mean, he was just talking about worms because obviously he didn't know about the worms yet. Right, right, right. But um, I do think it could be foreshadowing that, what was I saying? Like, talking about worms multiplying could be a hint at, you know, the fears and the dangers and the scary stuff is multiplying. Mm-hmm. There's more things happening. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Mark. Cousin HD called me out on my comments about Jim, uh, that the pro- his problems with Victor was, and he quoted me directly, first season shit, and that kind of amused the heck out of me, that he quoted me exactly. Uh, he correctly pointed out that even though this was last season, it wasn't that long ago. Right. We've talked about the compressed timeline, yeah, I which mean, is a highly unusual we are, I mean, we've now progressed a few more days in this season, but most of this season, too, was still, you know, within 24 hours of the radio call, which was within two weeks of the Matthews arriving. Right, right. So we're like three-ish weeks in at this point. And while I see his point, I still think that saving his wife and saving his daughter should have bought Victor some credit. Sure. And also, I didn't get to say this last week, uh, but I, I was trying to, <laughs> and then we kind of moved on. Uh, he has no business calling anybody an emotionally stunted freak, because I kind of feel like Jim is, himself is emotionally stunted. Now, you pointed out last week that he really doesn't have any relationships in this town. Like, almost every single person in this cast has someone. You know, he has his family, but that's about it. He has his family, and he hasn't been that close with his family, to be honest. Right, exactly. And um, most of his relationships have been working relationships. He worked with Jade, not because they were best friends, because but because he was working with him. Right. He tried to recruit Boyd, not because he likes him. In fact, I think he doesn't. But because he was trying to recruit him for a worker relationship. Mm-hmm. And he's not palling around with Randall in this episode because he wants to be best friends forever. And it's certainly not his charm. It's because... It's a working relationship. Right. So uh, Jim has not really developed any kind of real relationships within this town. And I find that very interesting. Almost every single other character has something. Right. Um, on Twitter, Lil, Little Foxy Baby uh, said that the rhyme in this episode, she thinks signifies that three people are, are going to die. Uh, and that one of them might have already died at the end of this episode. We'll, we'll get to that point. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I didn't, well, yeah, again, we'll talk about that yeah. later. I was going to talk about that some more, but uh, we'll, we'll skip that. Uh, yeah, this any... episode stuff we can talk about right. during this episode. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, okay, so do you have any notes before we go on? Um, just the whole Friday the 13th Night on Elm Street thing, and we covered that. So I'm good to start talking oh. about the episode, because I think it's going to be a long one. Yes, <laughs> I, I actually, I'm surprised I managed to get through all that, uh, within a reasonable amount of time. So I'm proud of myself. <laughs> all right, so, uh, we start this episode off with Kenny joining his mother in the kitchen. He asks about the family, which is a weird way to refer to the Matthews, but whatever. Mrs. Wu says they're still sleeping, and she asks if he's hungry. He says yes, though I don't think he's going to be in a few minutes. <laughs> uh, the phone rings. Yeah, she, she's cooking his favorite meal, she says. Yes. Um, I, I doubt that. I, I hope not. I, I, I hope not. I want to yeah. know, what is Kenny's favorite meal? Right. Do you want to cook it for him? 
Maybe get Mrs. Wu to teach you? I, I did ask her to send me recipes. You did, you did. I saw that. <laughs> The phone rings, which is not supposed to happen. Yeah, so as soon as the phone rings, I'm like, that's new. Although, like, I still had a pretty good idea at this point. I'm getting too good at picking it out. I, right. I knew right. that this wasn't really happening. Um, I, I mean, honestly, my reaction was, Kenny, don't answer that phone. Really? Because but, I would have answered it. How, I, could, I mean, how could you not answer it? I mean, I guess you're right. How I, could I you not said. be curious to know what the heck that is? I mean, maybe it's salvation on the line. Yeah, Maybe. Uh, I think it's somebody trying to reach Kenny about his extended warranty. I, I waited three days to make that joke. I almost just spit water everywhere. I'm Good sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he answers, and he gets this little, uh, what sounds like a recorded message saying, they touch, they break, they steal, no one here is free, here they come, they come for three, Yeah. unless you stop the melody. Any idea what the heck that means? Okay, so... Let's break it down. They touch, they break, they steal. I've seen people talking about those three things might signify who the three they are coming for could be. Yeah. Um. So we three people have now seen the music box. In mm-hmm. that. Oh, that that uh, brings me back to a point that I made last week, in that uh, I pointed out that the people that were seeing the m- music box were all involved in the smiley death or they being were. around that corpse so far. Yeah, Three so far that we've, we've seen. seen so far. Yep. Um, and these people are Mary, Kenny, and Elgin. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Mary has stolen things. Okay. She stole the morphine. Yep. Um, Kenny broke something, which is Sarah's ornament. Oh, Which right. we did see in this episode. She was holding her yep. broken ornament. They're keeping that fresh in our minds. But I did it, and I didn't see anybody come to anything involving Elgin. That involves mm. breaking, stealing, or touching something he shouldn't. Mm. Although, there is somebody who has been called out for touching. And who would that be? That would be Jade. Jade, okay. And I was reminded of it in the featurette that aired after the live show. Mm. Um, you know, they usually have like a couple minute little clip, and then they'll end up sharing that on their socials later. And I forget exactly what they were talking about. But in that, they referred back to the scene where Victor was yelling at Jade for the violin thing. Right. And Victor specifically says, don't touch my things. Right. And he He also stole that. He did steal it. But specifically, Victor called him out for touching his things. So the word touch was mentioned. I'm wondering if the three are Mary, Kenny, and Jade. And Jade will the Jade one? will see the music box. And maybe Elgin seeing the music box is more to do with um how he just already has a connection and is seeing things. Right. Or maybe everyone will start seeing things. I don't know. Um, so so basically they're on the chopping block unless you can stop the melody. Unless you can stop the melody, which what does that mean? Well, I had two thoughts about that. Okay. One was maybe the music box. Right. Or Break two, the music box? Possibly. Or the cicadas. Interesting, because they, they, they could be sing. a melody. Yeah, I was thinking, what, break the music box, kill the ballerina. I mean, she hasn't showed up for anybody other than Boyd. Right. Um, the jukebox. Though it's interesting that a lot of people thought that the one who was trying to drown Elgin. In fact, the Forbes article specifically said that the that creature was the ballerina. I don't know where they're yeah, getting that I don't from exactly. Get but, that. Yeah, but um, but I do think they're both characters are somehow related to this music box mm-hmm. and, and what's happening here and maybe we'll get a third visitor or maybe the cicadas themselves are the third visitor mm-hmm. ballerina scary bathtub lady cicadas maybe since they all appeared with the music box at some point right i don't know it th- there's there's riddle upon riddle upon riddle here and i think we'll get some of these answers in the next couple episodes i, I hope so because but... if they don't give us anything on this people are going to forget right what mm-hmm. we're even talking about by the time uh, they, we they, back ha- to they it, have so. to they have to so wait. i think this whole thing will make sense right um soon okay so he ends up hanging up the phone uh mrs who asks are you okay is everything okay and and kenny basically says i don't know um he notices a soup which is boiling cicadas live cicadas yes no yes yes no they were alive <laughs> they were live yes. uh one ends up weeping out and burning his arm we see the music box and the next thing we know, Mrs. Wu is waking Kenny up. And he still has the burn on his arm. Right. And oh, by the way, 
me and Kenny are almost oh, twinners. Oh my goodness. Yes, I got a little burn on my arm. Yeah. Not, not in the exact spot. but It's uh, pretty close to the same spot. I know, right? Yeah, you should add a picture of that. I, I, maybe I will. Um, So one thing I saw people talking about is, oh, the cicadas burned him. Okay, I got to point out, the reason the cicada burned him... Is because it was boiling. Is because it came out of a pot of boiling water. Right. It's not that the cicadas have burning power. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so either, but it'd be pretty cool if they did. But but what we're getting here is something that happened in a dream mm. is affecting him in real life. Right. So. And credits, by the way. And, and Sarah, credits, Sarah. which seemed really fast this week compared yep, yep. to what we've had lately. Mm -hmm. Um. So, a couple thoughts on, on what's happening with the dreams. And, you know, we'll get to more of this later, but are the characters pulling things, physical things, out of their dreams? Mm -hmm. Like... Did he manifest the cicadas from his dream? And oh, did Elgin manifest water? Because, you know, we'll get to talk about that soon. Or is it more like just your dreams can kill you, Freddy Krueger style? Right. That's a good question. Um, Yeah, either way, it's a yeah. really bad situation. Mm -hmm. So after the credits, we come back with Jim and Randall. Yes. Randall asks, what's the point? And Jim starts to explain what they're doing. Yeah, and they're at the and, RV at this yes. point. They've got wires and the antenna both hooked up to the drone. They're talking about a mole, right? Mm -hmm. We get this deep conversation about, well, is there a mole? Who would the mole be? There has to be someone. I confess this week that I am, in fact, the mole on Facebook. Uh, a post that got a surprising amount of reactions. Yes, so, you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so but what uh, Jim is referring to... Is, oh, actually, I'm sorry. What the question Randall is asking is... What's the point of the experiment that they are being inflicted with? Right. And Jim Sink thinks that there's a value in determining how much a person can take before they break. And he brings up Sarah and Sarah's situation, which is unfortunate for Sarah in this episode, but not as unfortunate as it is later for Donna. Uh, they try out the drone. It does not get very far in the air. Yeah, it can't go high enough. I made the joke that it's because of the giant red herring attached because this, this is not going to come up. This is not going to be a plot point for the rest of the episode, really. The whole antenna thing is just an excuse to get Randall and Jim working right. together. Right, and, and this just show, pulls you into, you know, Jim's obsession mm. with this freaking radio antenna. Right. And no, they didn't talk about video at all, which right. I thought they were actually going to yeah, get to when yeah. they talk about the drone again. Um, now, here's the thing. The drone couldn't get high enough, according to Randall. There is speculation out there yes. oh, yeah. that <laughs> he's lying. So people are suspecting Randall now. Maybe he's the mole, and he's here just trying to cause chaos. I don't know if I buy that, but it is something to keep an eye on. It is something that uh, Clara Mack uh, said in one of the comments, which is what led to that all that conversation, uh, is that uh, she suspects that Randall is possibly the mole. Yeah, a lot of people suspect that. So the people that... That the people that the fandom really has their eyes on at this episode is Donna and Randall. Right. So their interactions are something to to keep that in mind I as mean, we're going through. Randall, them. maybe Donna. I don't think so. I don't think I, so. I've seen too many of her weak moments to possible, believe that. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. Any at this point, anything is possible. There's literally nothing I would rule out at this mm. point. I mean, in my honest opinion, I don't think there actually is a mole. I don't necessarily think there is either. I think they want us to think that mm. they being that you know the show creators. Right. Um, because I think they're trying to really surprise us with right. whatever is going to happen. Um, yeah, by the way, that, uh, if that's as far as that drone can go, that's a really lame drone. Well, it's not designed to carry wire and antennas. Okay, fair enough. It's designed to fly on its own. It's not a package delivery service. It didn't, you know. Right. <laughs> Uh, um, Randall thinks that they should be looking at the people in the town. Yeah, so his theories really go off the deep end. Yeah, this is where they completely lose me, and they, they lose me for the rest of and the episode. they but. should have lost Jim at this point. Yeah, they should have. They should have. He, he, uh, so Randall asks a question specifically, uh, did you see these people die, like Father Cotri? Well, Jim didn't see it, but I did. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, that to me is proof that Randall is way off base so, here. So, Randall's Unless we're saying suggesting this is, yeah. in, in this conversation that nobody's died, mm. all the deaths have been fake, which would mean all of the people that have died are in on it. Right. And everybody who's cleaned up the bodies and interacted with the bodies is in on it. Right. So, who so does that leave left? Not a lot of people. So, right. who's the experiment on? I guess uh, <laughs> Randall and Jim at this point. <laughs> and who wants to experiment on them? If I saw Randall in real life, I would 
like completely avoid him and never talk to him. But anyway, this so is um, so Randall says, yeah, this must be this is why they don't want you looking out the windows mm-hmm. because they don't want you to see what's really going on. They just want you to be clouded in fear. And Randall, if you look back, you can see Randall's had this thought the whole time he's been here, right. all the way back to. Um, was it episode two? We spent yes. the night in the yep. diner. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, I can hear it, but it's awful convenient. I can't see anything. Right. <laughs> and by the way, the more these two talk in this scene, the more I'm convinced they are completely off base. They are completely wrong. Um, Randall's clearly crazy. Yeah. He's either crazy or he is the mole and all this is on purpose. And he's just trying to get to Jim. I mean, that's that's possible. Yep. Um, I mean, unless he's right. Maybe it is the whole thing's fake and the whole thing's a joke on us i don't know like i said i think anything's possible at this point um the concept that that everybody's in on it 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 brings up um in my mind an episode of sliders okay um so there's a, a an episode of sliders where they end up and they're inside this like it's all a theater they're inside a san diego where it's a the whole thing's a theater a sherlock holmes mystery oh, okay. and every this. single okay. person is an actor and they're faking their own deaths and they're doing all this and the whole thing is just for like five people who aren't the actors that are like mental patients including, or something like that arturo who uh they, they think has some kind of break this is like a heavily in uh work influence culture and they do this uh to get them back to work basically in that in that episode if i recall correctly yeah some something like that but mm. It just reminded me of that, like thinking like, well, everybody's in on it and they're faking their deaths and everybody's an actor. Right. It, it would be a hell of a twist, except they're told us that theory, so it's not it. Right. <laughs> uh, you can pretty much count on anything that they're actually telling us is probably not actually what's going on. Exactly. Um, so Sarah ends up entering Boyd's office. She wants to go back to the woods to get answers. Boyd thinks she's running away from the town. It's the easy thing, and they don't have the luxury of an easy thing. Sarah says that there's nothing that she can do at the church, and she yeah, just, she just can't sit around. She's bored. Right. She wants to help. Yeah, I think she's running away, but also, why not let her go out? Right. Like, what harm could it do? Mm-hmm. Other than the fact that, you know, she wants to take a talisman. Right. And, you know, you could lose a talisman that way, but... Mm-hmm. I don't know. If she wants to go out and look for answers, I say let her go. Yeah, uh, so, but Boyd sees that the, her boredom as great, the problem that they can actually solve. Yeah, and he wants about. to find ways to make her useful. I just want to know, why isn't she in the jail cell? Uh, I don't know. Why is she staying in the church in the first place? Put her in the jail cell. If she's a prisoner, lock her up. Mm-hmm. If she's not, let her go. I mean, no one seems to be overly concerned about this anymore. Yeah, everybody forgot about Sarah. Even Boyd. Like, when he she walks in the room, I feel like he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot about you. <laughs> yeah, you haven't been here in two episodes, so out of sight, out of mind. I mean, his brain's on, you know, monster in the basement. Right. Uh, we cut to Tabitha and Jade at the entrance of the cave. Yeah. This so, is where chaos theory comes up. And, you know, we thought they were going to go into the caves. That doesn't happen. We actually spent a very little time here for mm. how many um, of our... Our uh, set photos came from this scene. <laughs> right. Uh, basically, he says, he explains chaos theory. You know, a butterfly flaps its wings in, you know, these coyotes, and somewhere else a tasami happens. Um, and, of course, Tabitha doesn't have any clue what he's talking about. Yeah. And it, but really, what he's saying is everything's connected. Mm-hmm. And they just don't know how yet. And he's looking for the clues to connect the dots on how everything's going. And I think he's spot on here. Oh, absolutely. I think all of the people here are here for a reason. Mm -hmm. I don't think anything is random. I think every one of these clues connects to each other somehow. And we, the viewers, in addition to them, the characters, just haven't figured it out yet. And that's the closest thing I can get to of uh, the meaning behind our episode title. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. I like, I was completely... Yeah, Forest for the Tree. So yeah. I think we, and especially the characters, are not seeing the big picture. The expression is usually forest through the trees. It's, I've heard it both ways. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, basically just meaning, you know, you miss the big picture because you're focused on a tiny detail. Right. And... We have all these groups, right, that are doing that. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got our, our let's, we got the Monster in the Basement group, and that's yeah. all they're thinking about. And then, you know, now the bile. You know, we've got um, every character, like Jim and, and Randall, have their own little, let's, you know, look at this conspiracy thing. 
Jade's always off in his own world trying to figure out things on his own. And, I, and, and I'm pretty sure that's how he is in real it's life. It's the too. whole idea that none of them have come together to connect how all of these seemingly completely unrelated things might actually be related. Mm -hmm. And as far as I want to say, I think some of these characters might be related. I've mentioned that before, but um, I think they all not... Some of them blood relations, some of them life relations, some of them I think they have connections to each other that they haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm. So Jade realizes that Victor probably saw the symbols down in the tunnel. Yeah, and it's... I feel so bad for Victor in this moment because Jade's like, yeah, we can't go in there. Only a crazy person would do that. And that made him think of Victor. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't know, pot kettle calling pot, uh, pot black, Jade... Uh, Jade, Jade says that the, in the entire venogram of crazy, there is only one single point of overlap. He doesn't say who, but we cut to Victor. Yeah, and and so he's mad right now that um, he Victor promised him, you play me the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the Twinkling Star song, and I'm going to tell you everything I know about the symbol. But he didn't mention the caves. Right. And that's why the tunnel's here. Um, that's why Jade's so upset. He's like... Mm. Frick, he lied to me. He hid something from me. Right. And, ugh. Okay, so, Victor is going to Mrs. Wu's house. She knocks on the door looking for Ethan. Julie answers and invites him in, but he declines. And he ends up declining going into the house twice. Yeah. Why? Okay, so, people have a lot of crazy theories about this. Oh, he's a vampire. No. <laughs> I don't believe um, it. Um... People are suggesting maybe he had some trauma in this house, particularly, possibly. Mm -hmm. um, my ideas were simply more like Jim told him to stay the frick away from his family. <laughs> He's scared of Jim, so he doesn't want to go in the house where right. the family's staying. Mm -hmm. Maybe he thinks Jade's in the house because Jade was staying in this house. And right. He's trying to avoid Jade. Maybe he just knows better being a grown man than to go into a house alone with children. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't think so. I don't think he does know that, but, like, maybe. Like, maybe he's aware <laughs> enough of the fact that he's this creepy dude, mm. and it's not going to be good for him to be behind closed doors with them. Yeah, I somehow just don't think that Victor and really thinks like that. Also, you know, he's trying to keep... He's trying not to form these connections, mm -hmm. and he's trying to distance himself, even though he cares about Ethan and he's here to do something nice for Ethan. He's still trying to... To draw a line and to keep some distance between them because it scares him to care right. about people. Yeah. And so maybe going in the house is just a level of care that he's trying to distance himself from. Makes sense. Um, okay, so Julie thanks Victor for saving her. And uh, that happened last season. And all Victor can say is, okay. Because, you know, he doesn't he doesn't really... Uh, he's not really up with the social... Uh, nest, I don't know how to pronounce that word. He's not really good with the social mores, uh, you know, saying, oh, well, you're welcome. Yeah. He's not the type. Anyway, um, Ethan tells him that they're going to go help Mrs. Wu out at the diner. Victor offers him a coat to keep him warm. His old coat. Yes. It's been around since the 70s, a really warm looking uh, red plaid coat. And Victor says, because it's getting cold, our only like mention reminder that mm. seasons are changing. Yeah. Things are happening. The only problem is that by the time season three rolls around, this coat's no longer going to fit Ethan. Um, in fact, he's probably going to be like a teenager by the time season three comes along. Um, Ethan offers him a drawing, but Victor doesn't want it. Yeah, so he, he's not just Ethan being rude, Ethan made though. a drawing of yeah. himself. Right. And Victor doesn't want it, he said, because pictures are for things that are gone. And he doesn't want to think about Ethan being gone. And Ethan, Ethan's like, but what if something happens to me? Don't you want to remember me? Right. And it's... So many scenes between these two are just heartbreaking yeah. on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, but Ethan won't take the coat if he doesn't take the drawing. Yeah. And that's enough to convince Victor, at least for the moment, to take the drawing. Yeah, so Victor and... takes the drawing, Ethan keeps the coat, and Julie says, all right, let's go to the diner. We gotta go. They invite Victor to come with. And he does. I'm totally surprised that he did, honestly. I know. Like, they got Victor to come to the diner. And we'll see soon. He actually works in the diner, helping them. Right. Like, this is huge character growth for mm -hmm. Victor. Right. Um, Boy, the colony house is with Ellis. And Ellis is way too happy. Yeah, he's feeling great. That's he, not weird at all. He's uh, he's healing really fast. Okay. Um, we've talked about the compressed time frame. Yeah. I forgot to mention the fact that 
season one, Ellis broke his arm. Yeah. And then... That was a week ago. Yeah. And, and then he gets stabbed. He got stabbed. Like, his lung was punctured, I right. think. Right. Something um, along those lines. And that was yesterday? Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. That's a little that's a little fast healing, for sure. Uh, Boyd ends up asking about Dale. And Ellis answers that he's locked up and that he's not a problem. Yeah. So, we're, we're forgetting about Dale. That's, right. That's, that's their way of them saying, yeah, Dale's still there. He's cool. We're, we're, we're good. We're, we're moving on. We're not dealing with this right now. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they dealt with it at all is enough for me at this time. Um, Ellis is about to share newest. Wow. Newest. New- <laughs> He's going to share some newest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess that works. Um, yeah, he's about to share some news about uh, Fatima. But Donna interrupts. Someone told her that Boyd wanted to talk to her. And uh, Ellis is all like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll tell you we'll later. Tell- yeah, that's... Don't do that. That That's is foreshadowing for somebody's going to die and not ever either be able to tell the news or be able to receive it. Right. I don't think it's Boyd. We've said this before. Harold Pernod is the top actor in the yeah, show, think... the most recognizable one. Okay, so I said this to you off air. At this point, I don't feel like anybody's safe. Yeah. Um, And I think multiple people are going to die in the next couple episodes. Yeah, yeah. But if I were to say one person that's safe, I think it would be Boyd. Just because I think MGM is smart enough not to remove their highest billed cast member. Right. Um, for that reason only. Mm-hmm. I don't think within the story Boyd is safe, but I think for practical reasons he's safe. That makes sense. Uh, Fatima and Ellis, on the other hand, uh, not so sure about that one. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, yeah, like I said, when this happens in movies, someone's going to die. It just, It's just... just it's basically foreshadowing and for somebody's And they're death. supposed to be getting married. Right. Like, there's a lot of things that are, like, hanging in, in limbs for them. It's not good. And in this show, nobody can be as happy as Ellis is for very long. Uh, Donna, I'm sorry, Boyd ends up asking a favor from Donna, who isn't happy about it. Basically, Boyd wants Sarah to give, uh, I mean, uh, Boyd wants Donna to give Sarah something to do. Right. He wants, Bo- <laughs> Boyd wants Donna to give Sarah some tasks to keep mm. her busy and make her feel useful. Right. And she's complaining about a headache in the scene, and she will for the rest of yeah. the episode. Yeah, Donna has a terrible headache, and um, I'm so sorry for your headache, Donna. Yeah. We, we got some aspirin. I mean, there's some morphine back at the clinic. There is, right? Yeah. There's, there are things there. I mean, there I are think, painkillers. I think that's rather extreme for a headache. <laughs> I mean, maybe still. a drop of it. Right. <laughs> Um, but they have bigger problems. Tensions are rising in the, in the house. There's a madman who's locked up for stabbing somebody. And Elgin nearly drowned in his sleep. Right. Which brings Boyd to go visit Which, Elgin. I think it's great that they brought us back to that moment. Mm-hmm. The same way that they're, you know, letting Boyd in on it. Mm-hmm. And we didn't just drag this out or forget about it. Like, right. we're right here. They're telling us, yep, this happened. Right. And now we're going to talk about it. Uh, so I think premonition is off the table or uh, what these dreams actually signify. We were we were considering the fact that they might not actually just be dreams, but premonitions. It just seems to indicate that it's something else. Yeah. So we got the answer to one of the most asked questions last week. Right. Why was Elgin taking a bath with his clothes on? And the answer is he wasn't. The entire thing was a dream. Mm-hmm. He never got in the bathtub. The whole thing was his dream that he got in the bathtub with his clothes on. And uh, he ended up getting shoved awake by somebody. And he had water coming out of his mouth. Boyd says that there's some good news, however. They extracted what might be poison to the monsters, but he doesn't know how to inject it without being murdered or eaten alive. And Elgin asks, well, you have a gun, right? And Boyd seems very amused by this question. The answer is yes. And Elgin suggests silver bullets, which is something that you would use to kill werewolves. Right, and we don't hear his explanation in this, but we'll hear the explanation later when uh, Boyd talks to Kenny. And, you know, I feel like Elgin is constantly coming up with creative solutions Mm -hmm. and coming up with answers quickly. Yes. He seems very on top of, like, uh, well, here's what you need to do. Here's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Like, it's all very matter-of-factly to him. And I don't know if that's just because he's smart or... Does he have some inside info here? I don't know. I mean, he, he <laughs> has had premonitions in the past, so maybe he's had some images about that. Um, and he also, in this scene, lied to Boyd that he didn't tell anyone about Smiley. Oh, Boyd yes. specifically asked him, you didn't tell anybody, right? And he's like, no, I didn't tell anybody. Yeah, he didn't tell Julie about it or nothing. No, not at all. 
while flirting about and uh, saying that he's never taken baths and using that as a way to shoot his shot. Um, and I don't think he's ever going to take a bath now. Um, yeah, I definitely went after that. No. That's for sure. And also to know in this scene, Elgin is crocheting, just like he used to do with his grandma. Aww. Which it's... is a weird thing for them to show us, so I wonder if like that's going to mean something at some point. Maybe, possibly. I mean, everything usually does at some right. point. Right, you have to like look at every single thing in this show and like wonder if it's something that you need to be paying attention to. All right, so we cut to the diner, and Ethan is telling Victor about the internet. And Julie ends up confirming that the internet does actually exist. Yeah. And, and that's an interesting point, because Victor has lived in this This town. is another, like, amazing, like, Victor-Ethan yeah. moment. And I feel cheated that we didn't actually get to hear what Ethan's explanation of the internet was. We picked up on the conversation after Ethan's done explaining it, and Victor's like, nah, you're kidding me. Maybe there's a deleted scene. And where it Ethan's like, like Julie, like, like, tell him I'm telling the truth, like the internet. And she's like, mm. yeah, that's a thing. And she's amused. And you know, I feel like this is telling us, hey, Victor's not faking this. Right. Victor's not in on it. Mm -hmm. He genuinely is this child that's been trapped here for forty years. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Scott McCord does an exceptionally good job with that. Uh, just uh, in case you're listening, Scott. Uh, so, Mrs. Wu ends up asking Victor to carry something, and he goes into the back. Yeah. Julie asks if Ethan is going to wear the coat all day, and Ethan says, yeah, I like it. And she tells him that it smells very musty. Well, I mean, the coat is like, I don't know, like 40 years old yeah. at this time. Um, I mean, they go wash it. They can wash it. Yeah. They got laundry. Just stick it in the water and then dry it at Colony House. Or give it to Sarah. That's, I guess, what that's what uh, Donna's going to end up giving her. <laughs> In comes Jade and well, oh, oh before I'm sorry, that, actually, yeah, 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 well. Um yeah. so so Ethan puts his hands in the pockets of the coat and yep. finds something. A toy. It's this weird little like anthropomorphic crayon dude toy. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what this is. Later on, um, when Tabitha's interacting with it, she opens it. It, it almost looks like it's a pen. Mm. Um, and she's like, oh, I remember these. I don't remember these. Neither do uh, I. I. I don't know what this is, but I love it. And I've added it to my list of from things I want. Okay. I want a talisman. I want the lunchbox. And now I want the weird crayon dude. Well, if you're looking for a Christmas gift for <laughs> Stacy, you know what to get. Um, yeah, so he ends up showing it to Victor. Yeah, he's like, what's this? And the toy ends up triggering a memory for Victor. Yeah, we get a seems... really tiny flashback in mm -hmm. Victor's memory um, just enough to know that he's with his mother and she hands this to him in the root cellar. Yep. Um, yeah, so. And he gets weirded out. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, this is clearly like too much for him right now, just seeing this toy. And at this moment, Jade and Tabitha come in. Yeah, in and spectacular Jade, timing. Yes. Uh, Jade ends up accosting Victor again. Tabitha is trying to rein in Jade, but you know how well that goes. And, and Victor, this was the worst moment right. to approach Victor. I mean, of course, he doesn't know that, but read the room. <laughs> Jade, Jade doesn't know how to do that. Let's be real here. Uh, and Victor ends up walking yeah, away. Yeah, he says, I gotta go. Jade needs to know everything. Oh, he, he, so he runs at Jade's run... chasing Victor, yeah. literally chasing Victor down the street, yelling at him. Mm. Why'd you hold back information? Right. Everything is important. Everything you know, you have to tell us. And Tabitha's chasing behind both of them. Right. I, I love this scene, by the way. Uh, he ends up saying, uh, Jade ends up saying, every little information might, may be, might be lead us to how we get home. Don't you Don't want Don't you want to go home? This is the threequel uh, scene uh, between Jade and Victor this season. And Victor says what was the yeah, subtext. The thing that we've all knew was right. there, except for Jade. He's the only one who didn't pick right, up right. on this. Yeah, it was a subtext in the first scene between the two of them. He says he is home. Yeah. This is this his is home. This is his home. This is all he knows. And he doesn't have anywhere else to go. Victor ends up going away, uh, walking off, and uh, Jade has a really shocked expression on his face, like he didn't consider it a, this this fact about Victor. And of course he didn't. Tabitha asks Jade, "What's wrong with you? Are you physically incapable of not being an asshole for more than ten minutes?" Yeah. And he, he's like, "Oh, great! You're yelling you're at yelling me. You're yelling at me again. That didn't take long." So remember last week, yeah, yeah. he was like, I like you so much more when you're yeah. not yelling at me. Mm. And now he screwed up again. Mm. And she's yelling at him. She's chastising him, saying, like, what the fuck, Jade? <laughs> like, stop. Stop being right. Jade. Right. <laughs> and right. she, like, goes off after Victor. And um, 
Yeah, like I said, I love the scene. <laughs> I love I love Jade's character. Uh huh. Yeah. And I love Jade and Tabitha, and I'm I'm sold on that ship. Yeah. yeah. I, I said last week I could see it. I'm sold on it. Team Jabatha. Yeah, I I now I'm with you. Uh, particularly since Jim completely and totally yeah, loses me by the end. Yeah, I of I'm episode. over Jim. Jim, I don't care if you survive this night. <laughs> right, right. I'm Team Jabatha, unless it turns out they're related, because oh. some of my theories later might get us there. So okay. In, in that case, this is a family quarrel. Yeah. Uh, so we see <laughs> Sarah at the church looking at the ornament. Uh, I guess she managed to fix that. Well, I think it was still broken. She was like holding the pieces. Okay. Uh, in enters Dumb and Dumber, Randall and Jim, and they start asking questions. And Jim introduces Randall by name. Yes. Oh, yeah. We finally yeah. had his name spoken out loud in the show. Mm-hmm. And Sarah's like, yeah, I know who he is. <laughs> right. Jim is trying a gentle approach, just asking questions, but Randall is a butthead, like usual. Jim did a good job. He's yeah. like, we need your help, mm-hmm. right? And what has Sarah been saying this episode? She wants to be helpful. Say what you will about Jim, and I have plenty to say about him, but he does have some charm. He does have a way some of... Some tact. Yeah, of dealing with people. <laughs> That someone like Jade or Randall or even Victor completely and totally lacks. Right. Uh, I, I completely don't buy anything that he does in this episode. But he could potentially get somewhere uh, just by charming people and using his tact. Exactly. Exactly. But, uh, of course, and, the person um, he's chosen to partner up with uh, is not going to let is him not, do that. Yeah, absolutely. So he manages to get... Um, to get Sarah to tell us, you know, where were you going? What's, you know, we, we don't know. We want to know about the, how people got here or whatever. And we know that they are really trying to find out if Sarah is lying. Right. But she tells us, um, you know, canon within the series now that uh, they were on their way back to Boston from New Hope, Pennsylvania. Nathan had come to to rescue her from a bad situation. Um, I mean, we already knew that. If you're paying attention behind the scenes, uh, we knew from her missing poster last year that, you know, she was traveling from New Hope to Boston. Mm-hmm. So they have not contradicted those posters, which I'm happy about. That's good. And um, we have learned before in season one that that she had what sounds like an abusive ex. You know, mm-hmm. she had told Christy she did have somebody, but he was bad. And Nathan had gone to get her. She says here that Nathan was her best friend. So, mm-hmm. again, telling us how close they were. And um, Randall, of course, is he, this isn't enough for him. He right. just spits it right out and yeah. asks, yeah. is your brother still alive? And, of course, Sarah reacts badly to this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Donna ends up entering the scene. Again, we've got perfect freaking timing. Right. And that's why a lot of people thought that she was the, the mole in this yeah. episode. But remember... Boyd asked her to come see Sarah. Right. So this is not like a total coincidence. Yeah. She's not here because Jim and Randall are. She's here because she's following up on Boyd's request. Which, which by the we way... we know, but yeah. they don't know that. Right. So, by the way, I said on Twitter that this is evidence of Donna's respect for Boyd. Absolutely. She doesn't like Sarah. She doesn't trust Sarah. She thinks Sarah belongs in the box and shouldn't be breathing anymore. But she still comes here to give Sarah something to do because Boyd asked her Right, to and on top it. of all the things Don is dealing with, including this horrible headache, right? she's still like, okay, let me go give this girl something right. to do. Uh, Randall gets instantly hostile with Donna. Um, and, yeah, basically... <laughs> um, yeah, she basically ends up telling the two men to leave. I love Donna in the scene because, like I said, everything I said about her relationship to Sarah, she doesn't trust her. She still sticks up for her. Yeah, and she asks Sarah, you know, are you okay? Right. Like, what right. just happened? She treats um, her because like Randall a Randall completely told Donna off, made it very clear that he doesn't trust her. Mm-hmm. Randall's not going to get anywhere. Right. You know, no. like like vinegar and honey here. Like. Right. <laughs> um, so, while I think Jim could have gotten further with this, I also think it was a serious lack of judgment on his part to ever include Randall yeah. in all which, this. Which, you know, that was in the episode description that we've yeah. been seeing all season was yeah. Jim's going to regret involving Randall. Yeah, we can see why. <laughs> I, I didn't need to read that episode description to realize that this was never going to end well. Yeah. Um, but okay, so uh, she ends up revealing that uh, they asked her about whether her brother was alive or not. And we cut to Jim, who's reading Randall the Riot Act for how he was behaving. And Randall says, do you want to get somewhere? Do you want to learn the truth? Or do you want to be everyone's best friend? 
Um, Jim doesn't think Sarah knows anything, but Randall says, Donna might. Right. And uh, honestly, these two have done nothing to convince me that they're on the right track. These two have not done a single smart thing. They can't thing in... even get on the same page among the two of them. Right. They, they haven't done a single smart thing in this episode. Like, I'm watching the Sarah scene going, what are you two doing? Right. This doesn't make any sense. And But Jim still thinks that he can rein Randall in right. and, and says, listen, I got a plan. Right. Uh, they want to go, well, Jim says that he wants to go to the RV at night and try to observe the monsters when they don't know they're being observed. I think this plan is a good way to become unalived. Honestly. Yeah, so his plan is hang out in the bus all day, act inconspicuous. Right. And right before nightfall, take the talisman that's on the bus, meet me at the RV. We're going to spend the night on the RV. No one's going to know we're there. So we can watch, right? And they're coming from the idea that it's fake and the monsters aren't real and they think maybe they'll see these actor monsters pretending like they're not monsters. Right. Um, which seems like a really silly idea in the mm. first place. Right. Like, why would you think they'd be out near the RV anyway? <laughs> so strike three for Jim here because this is another But also point. you can tell Jim's not convinced that's the case because he's bringing the talisman. Mm. If you really think it's fake, you're not going to worry about a talisman. Right. Um, so this, once again, this is another... All they've done is random shit in this episode. The, you know, first they were trying to work with the drone, then they're going to talk to Sarah, and now they're doing this stuff. Yeah. Like, they have no idea what the hell they're doing. Right. And uh, I'm pretty sure pretty sure that Randall is not... I mean, based on what happens later in the episode, uh, that's true. But I'm pretty sure that Randall is not convinced by this at all. No, but he agrees... And that's their plan. And then Jim goes to the diner to see his kids mm -hmm. and asks where Tabitha is. This is when we learn Tabitha left and went to Colony House to try and calm down Victor. And he tells Julie that he's going to spend the night in the RV. He says, don't worry about me. I have a talisman. I'm going to be inside. But I have an idea that's going to get us home. How is this going to get you home? I don't know. Uh, if I'm Julie, I'm like, you're insane. You're not doing this. Like, I would right. argue more here if I were Julie. So... The whole idea was we don't want anyone to know what we're doing, but now he told Julie, mm -hmm. which I think is going to turn out to be a good thing. Yeah. That might save somebody's life. Right. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, so Donna ends up catching Jim leaving the diner, and she wants to know what he was doing with Randall and Sarah. She, she, and look, look, honestly, Donna is more right about things more often than she's wrong. Yeah. You should absolutely be listening to Donna. Right, but see... Randall's convinced Jim that he can't trust Donna. Right. Oh, well. So he lies. Donna Straight says, to her face. Donna says, we talked about this. Right. And she knows. She's like, you have told him about the freaking voice. And he's a powder keg waiting to explode. Right. According to Donna. Which, which yeah. Absolutely right. She's obviously on the right track with that. But he's like, no, I didn't tell him about the voice. Which is a straight up lie. Straight up lie. So much lying in this episode, especially to Donna, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's going to break her. She right. realizes everyone's freaking lying to her. Um, and yeah, he's like, I didn't tell him that. We're just trying to figure out how to go home. And she's like, okay. Like <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, like, she, she describes Randall as a powder keg. Yeah, he's dumb as a rock, and on top of that, he's... Like, he has violent tendencies. He has anger management issues. This is a really bad combination in this situation. It is. It, intentions are mounting all around us. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all bad news. And after this conversation is concluded, we see Randall in the distance, on the bus, chilling like a villain. Yeah, doing exactly what Jim told him to do. Which is unusual. I'm surprised. It won't that. last long. No, no, unfortunately <laughs> not. Uh, we see Victor back at County House. We see flashbacks of him as a kid. His mother is telling him to hide. We hear a knock at the door, and Tabitha enters. And in that flashback, the crayon toy, which, you know, we just learned about, again, it was an extension of that, that flashback of his mother giving that toy to him. Mm -hmm. And then we see it sitting on the room in his, uh, in his room in Colony House. And I had to note that the crayon's arms... We're suspiciously in a ballerina pose. Okay. They were like up over the head. I forget what that's called. Whatever position that is. Uh, you're asking the wrong person. Yeah, there. It's, it's a ballet thing though. I definitely got that from its its little um little white arms on the crayon. Uh, she thanks him for the coat and mentions that she remembers that the toy that uh, Victor has. Mm -hmm. Victor asks for it back, and Tabitha Tabitha asks 
why didn't you tell Jade about the symbols in the tunnels? Yeah, she's, she's, Tabitha's really been stepping it up, mm. and a lot of people didn't like her. Yes. I think that's changing. Tabitha, she mothers Victor into being helpful. They specifically didn't like Victor and Tabitha together in the season premiere. Uh, I didn't have a problem with them together. I had a problem with the repetitiveness of those scenes. Yeah. Like, I think they could have been condensed a little bit. But uh, this is another, this is a great scene for the two of them, for sure. Tabitha is, she's a great mother. Yeah. And um, she questions that about herself because she blames herself for Thomas's death. But she's being a mother figure mm -hmm. to Victor. Now, I've said before that I don't think that Victor likes men. I think he specifically doesn't trust them as much as maybe women. Uh, I think that, you know, because of what happened with um, Christopher, Christopher, perhaps the reason that's his distrust, his reason for distrusting men and his mother is the reason why he prefers women. Right. And sure, we don't know, like, what his family situation was. Mm. Right. Like, was there a father in his life? We don't know. Maybe he was just raised by his mother. And right. Never had a male figure before mm -hmm. coming here. Um, Victor says people shouldn't go looking for answers because if they do. They don't come back. And Tabitha says looking for answers is probably their way out. And Victor says he doesn't think there is a way out. Yeah, and I feel like him saying, you know, when people look for answers, they don't come back. I feel like that's foreshadowing with what happens with his mother. Mm. Um, and I'm questioning, was her body among the dead that he found in the morning? Not or sure. did she leave on her quest that we'll soon learn about and literally never came back? Mm-hmm. Um, for him to say, if you look for answers, you don't come back. Right. Um, I'm wondering if he more feels abandoned by her than, uh, oh, she died. Like those you know, right. dozens of other bodies he had to bury. Mm -hmm. um, so his mom said they were going to go home and bad things happened that night. And he doesn't remember them. Right. Because he's compartmentalized them so much. He forced himself not to remember 40 years living in the crazy cuckoo town. I'm sure you could do that. Right. Right. Definitely uh, and, some repressed um, trauma. He says, he says he doesn't remember, but the pictures might. And and she's like, well, the pictures, you know, they all, they were in the house that fell down. We don't have your pictures. And he said, no, not those pictures. The other pictures, I hid them so that I wouldn't remember them. But he says, now I have to remember so no one else will die. Mm. He's terrified of these memories right. that he knows are, they're just below the surface. And he's so scared to remember them, but he also knows that he has information that's helpful, mm -hmm. right? Jade keeps accosting him for information. He knows. Victor gets it. Right. He knows he has something helpful to say, but he's just so scared to do it. Mm -hmm. And here we go. Like I said, again, Tabitha, you know, is mothering him and helping him and saying, you know, it's okay. Right. It's okay to remember. You're not alone and we'll get through it. So, yeah, Tabitha asked, do you remember where you put them? And he ends up nodding sadly that he does. Uh, we hear, we go to Boyd knocking on Mrs. Wu's door. Kenny answers. Awkwardness ensues here a little bit. Uh, Boyd notices the burn. And uh, Kenny says he managed to burn himself in his sleep. Why doesn't Boyd react right, to this Right, that more? seems like a weird thing to say. But he's, he's, his mind's on what he's here for, his mission. and But his his mind should be putting two and two together with Elgin and They will, Kenny They will later. Yeah, yeah. But um, he, he wants to tell Kenny his silver bullet plan. Mm -hmm. You know, Elgin's silver bullet plan. Right. Uh, so he thinks that they dip the bullet in, uh, oh yeah, and it's notable that Kenny doesn't understand this reference at all. He doesn't understand the silver bullet reference, doesn't, probably doesn't know anything about werewolves, I guess. Uh, never read, like, uh, or seen any horror movies of, of that type, I guess. I don't know. Um, but yeah, Boyd ends up suggesting that they dip the bullet in bile, fire from a safe distance, which I don't even know how they could figure out, you know. Well... I guess if you even are inside and open a window, you can fire. I guess. As long as you have somebody right. helping you not get lured into, you know, mm -hmm. into the whole charm of them to let them in. Right. Um, so, yeah, fire at the fire from a safe dis distance and see what happens. Yeah. Now, this, of course, is going on the theory that the worms are in the bile, possibly, and that could kill the monsters. And um, I don't think that ends up. Uh, being the case, honestly. No, I don't think so either. Uh, but, but Kenny ends up saying they'll need more of the bile. And uh, he, Boyd ends up saying that they that he's going to go to the clinic Yeah, now. he's like, that's where I'm going. So they head to the clinic to collect more bile from Smiley's body. Um, speaking of which, 
Why the hell is that body still there? Well, they're not done with it yet. They need to get the rest of the bile. <laughs> okay, but, like, you know, as soon as you finish that autopsy, that that body should have been out of that right. building. Well, also, how much time has passed, though? We're not really sure where we picked up right. between that's, that's, last that's a, episode and that this is a good episode. Point. So, you know, it could have been, like, two seconds since the last time Ben, Kenny, and Boyd saw each other. Yeah, it might have been, like, let's just go have lunch, and then we'll deal with this in right. a few minutes. <laughs> so, uh, Christy is taking care of Mary at the clinic. Boyd arrives, and they start hearing things coming from the where Smiley is in yeah, the boiler so, room. So what's happening here, they walk in on the scene. Christy's trying to comfort Mary. Mary had just been downstairs, mm -hmm. and this just happened moments before Boyd and Kenny got there. Mary heard something, mm -hmm. and she's telling Christy this, um, that something's happening downstairs. Christy hasn't had a chance to investigate yet. So they all like go to the stairs together. And this image of them at the top of the stairs, that image surfaced weeks ago and I was waiting for this to happen. Finally, right. <laughs> we're there. Um, and Ken, uh, Boyd gives us the line, like, if you hear anything coming up the stairs, run. I mean, that's generally my policy. Yeah, so th this they were they wanted us to think, you know, with this being in the trailer, that Smiley got up and started walking around. That's, <laughs> that's not what happened. We, we get rid of that theory really fast. Yeah, Boyd and Kenny go to investigate. And they go into the boiler room. Uh, and Boyd, you know, Kenny ends up taking out his gun. Uh, Boyd says, hey, why don't you go upstairs? And Kenny's like, nah, nah, I'm, I'm doing yeah, this. Yeah, we're, we're here together. He's, he's much more braver than I would be and much <laughs> braver than he was last week. Because last week, his concern wasn't for himself. It was for Christy. Yeah. Uh, Boyd opens the door. They go in. The sheet smiley is under is moving. I'm gone at this point. <laughs> like, I'm not investigating <laughs> any further. I don't care. Burn the whole clinic down. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Boyd lifts the Boyd lifts the sheet, and there's a bunch of cicadas coming Hundreds out of the body. Hundreds of cicadas. Right. Um, Which is creepy enough. Right. But yes. of course, this hit a nerve with Kenny specifically. Yeah. Um, so they go back upstairs. Kenny describes his dreams and is ranting about the cicadas. Yeah, he's like, they were in my dreams. Right. That's how I got burned. He mentions the music box even, which mm -hmm. neither Boyd nor Mary, like, comment on. Right. And that's another <laughs> point where I'm like, you know, like, uh, you know, Boyd, are you paying attention here? Like, this should have been something that Boyd reacted yeah. to. Right. Music box? Right. Was there a ballerina? <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, Kenny brings up the music box and the cicada burning him. Mary says... You're telling me that our dreams can hurt us now? Well, because in this scene also, Boyd tells them about Elgin, uh, Elgin and yeah. how he was actually drowning and woke up with water coming out of his mouth. So they very quickly realize the dreams are real. Right. At least in some some way, somehow, something bad is happening with our dreams. And like I said before, you know, are they bringing things back with them? Or, you know, did Freddy Krueger find a fallen tree? <laughs> right. And he's in Frumville now? I mean, this could be the way that uh, Smiley returns. Oh, by the way, uh, a poster on Facebook mentioned what cicadas actually are reminiscent for or stand for. And uh, in a lot of cases, they, they symbolize resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely don't think that they mean anything good in this episode, that's for sure. But the resurrection, could that be... And this poster thought that it could be um, that Smiley would return, be resurrected. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure... What the cicadas mean? Right. Maybe they mean the exact opposite of what they generally are thought right, to mean. Right, because in this world that we're in, nothing is as it seems. Right. Right. Um, I mean, my thought was cicadas, locusts, mm -hmm. are very similar creatures. They're in the same family, and this reminded me of the plague of locusts. Like, right. are we hinting towards something biblical here? Mm -hmm. And um, I, I told you earlier, like, if Father Kachi was here, I feel like he'd have something to say about that. He, he absolutely would. Um, would he think that the cicadas are close enough to locusts mm. to uh, to mean that that means something end times worthy? Right. Um, which is something that happened in Manifest. Um, oh, really? The final leg of Manifest finally landed. It is over. It was a great ending. I do suggest you go back and watch it. I know you started the series. You don't like watching things, you know, if you don't know where they're going. The series has ended now, so yeah. it's a good time to check it out. All right. Um, and they hit on the plague of uh, plague of locusts in mm. that. Uh, also coming out of a corpse. Well, actually, it wasn't a corpse. The person was still alive, but same idea. Oh, okay. That's pleasant sounding. <laughs> Um, so Donna ends up entering the scene. All right, so all of Donna's appearances at this point have made sense. Right. At this point, 
it doesn't make sense that she's here. Like, the, her timing here is way convenient. Well, we learn at the end yes. that the reason she came here is because of her headache, and she's looking for headache Right, pills. but when we first see her enter, it's like, okay, everything else about her appearance has made sense. Yeah. Why the hell right. is she here? So... But it's like, how long did you think you could hide this from Donna? And of right. all people that could show up, of course it's Donna. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, another another one of those like, oh, perfect timing. Like right. now they don't have a choice but to tell her, and we'll mm-hmm. we'll soon learn they tell her everything. Um, but before we move on from this scene, okay, I'm gonna share. Uh, Adam, my husband, had a theory. Oh boy. <laughs> about the the cicadas. All right, what's here? He thinks that the worms were actually larva for the cicadas. I actually completely buy that. I, th- I thought that the uh, worms were some somehow responsible for creating the cicadas. He thinks that the worms, um, putting them inside the smiley body, did whatever they needed to do to make them hatch. And now the cicadas hatched out of that body. Interesting. Um, and if that's true, then these silver bullets aren't going to do anything because there's not worms in the bile. The worms stayed in the body, became the cicadas, and now right. that's where they are. Yeah, I'm not convinced the bile is going to do anything. Honestly. Yeah. I mean, I think it might just be bile, and that's what they all have. And right. that's, you're just giving them their own bodily fluids back, which doesn't... Getting it them a taste of their own bile, anyway. Um, But... And that's, you know, that's where his theory ended. But if that's true, if the worms become the cicadas, I don't know, could the cicadas then become the crows? Right. Um, do we have this whole life cycle going of our monster creatures? Does the crows then become the monsters? Interesting. Um, resurrection. Maybe every one of these cicadas is going to turn into like little... smiley monster. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a whole bunch of smileys running around. <laughs> like like he, he now, you know, fathered these these cicadas <laughs> right jamie mcguire is definitely not going to have any shortage of work if that's the case i mean i'm still hoping we get jamie yeah. mcguire back yep yeah, yep yeah. um yeah i'm still hoping there, it's possible like maybe not this season but you know what in this world anything is possible between flashbacks and dreams and memories and weird stuff mm-hmm. his corpse in this episode looked very dead uh so i don't well, yeah think, i don't think that we've gonna be we've taken care of that smiley right but there's plenty i think i i see plenty of opportunity for them to still use jamie mcguire i'm sure um so we cut to victor and tabitha going to the junkyard that we saw when jade and victor went to see it yep victor says tabitha is a nice lady ethan is his friend's friend and he wants to help but he's afraid to remember he's afraid to remember and he goes to the trunk of the car, which we'll soon learn that's where the pictures are. We don't actually see that in this scene, though. He, 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 stand, he goes over and he oh, stands yeah, yeah, yeah. by it. And, um, uh, yeah, Ta- Tabitha tells him she needs him to be brave, and that's exactly what his mother said to him. Yeah, and so this is just a, a little tease of this scene that's going to come later. And uh, he, uh, Scott did such a great job throughout this episode, mm-hmm. like killing it yeah. in every scene. You can just, you feel all of Victor's emotions. Mm. And he's, he's been great this the, season the in The fact general. that he's, you know, willing to open up to Tabitha and that he keeps reminding her how afraid he is, that he just, he needs extra help to get there, you know? And it's, which, it's great. <clears throat> which is something that Jade was never going to be able to do for No, him. not at all. Not at all. Um, maybe he should be here, though, playing the violin during this. Right, maybe. Um, so, Boyd and Donna. Donna is chastising him for not telling her about the smiley death. And Boyd says he was going to tell her. He's like, no, 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 no. I walked in you, in on you on the act. This is not you about to tell me. Right. You were at my house earlier. You had an opportunity. Ask me for a favor. Right. And this is funny because they, this scene plays like an old married couple. Yeah, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Again, yeah. everyone's lying to Donna. Mm. And she's like, why? I'm supposed to be like the co-leader of this whole right, thing. Right, right. And, uh, you know, he makes he makes the excuse that he didn't want, uh, you know, everybody to panic. And Donna's like, since when am I anybody or right. everybody? And, yeah, um, Donna's right here. She's right, absolutely. Boyd is totally wrong. I mean, I get that they didn't want everybody to know when it right. happened, but he should have brought her in right. by this point. Um, he apologizes. Boyd says, it won't happen again. I don't believe him. I mean, presuming that... They might not get the opportunity well, for it to happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if they survive this episode this season, then I don't believe that Boyd is not... That this situation is not going to happen again. Yeah, because you know what? They're all too good at keeping things from each other. Mm-hmm. That's just what it boils down to. So, 
we we get the context here that they've told her the whole story at this point. And he brings her down to the boiler room to check it out. The bugs are gone. And Boyd is looking concerned. Donna isn't. Yeah, because she's just like, holy shit, there's a dead monster on the right. table. <laughs> um, and yeah, he's like, oh, well, they were all here. There were hundreds of them. And she's like, oh, they just scattered. But there, there's, you know, the door was closed. Right. Okay, Boyd, you're not this dumb. Bugs find a way to get out. They find a way, but also, it seems like only a minute or two has passed. Yeah, it hasn't been that long. It does ago. seem creepy that there's not a single bug in sight. Right. Like, this isn't just typical, yeah, the bug scattered. Mm-hmm. Like, whatever happened was not just bugs. Mm-hmm. Like, there's an intelligence to what's happening here. Right. Uh, Donna says they need to burn the body. No shit. They should have done that already. <laughs> yeah, and they're ready to now listen to Donna. Now, when right. Kenny said this over mm-hmm. and over and over, he right. was ignored. Mm-hmm. But as soon as Donna says it, that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, here's my thing. I'm still mad. We never looked for a freaking wallet. Oh, never yes. Never once did they right. look in Smiley's pockets. Yep. And I feel like there had to be one. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, by the way, this is a great episode for Donna, all in all. Like, I thought she was. A, this was a really strong, great episode Which for might her. be bad news for her. Yes. Yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so, they're outside. Um, Kenny and Boyd bring out the body. Donna suggests burning it in such a way that smoke won't attract curious onlookers. Boyd suggests, seems to start to suggest that the burning of the body might stop the dreams. He hasn't quite finished his sentence, and I, I think he knows he's not quite right. Yeah. That he, this is a not... He sounds re- like us with all these theories that right. don't aren't fully formed, and we don't know what we're actually trying to say about them. Right. It's, it's not a very solid assumption that if you burn the body, the dreams will stop. He suggests they sleep in shifts. Yeah, so now that they've come to the conclusion that your dreams can kill you, that's right. now their new concern, right, mm-hmm. is how are we going to survive sleeping? We can't just all go to sleep tonight. Right. And this little group of people are the only ones who know this, so they got to spread this word throughout mm-hmm. everybody in the community um, to sleep in shifts, you know, look out for each other. And this right. is another very Freddy Krueger thing <laughs> where, you know, that's what characters would do. They would take turns sleeping. And if you see someone struggling in their sleep, wake them up mm-hmm. because their dreams can kill them. Right. And um, Boyd says, you know, what about, they say, what about Sarah? He's going to bring her to the sheriff's station. Why wasn't she there already? Okay. Right. So they're going to bring her there. So it's going to be him, Kenny, and Sarah is and, what I'm gathering. And then he also suggests that Mary and Christy go to the sheriff's right. office. Because it makes sense. Mary's not going to be capable of helping Christy right. in her sleep right now. Um, yeah. Boyd ends up saying, hey, look, I've seen addiction. I know it could get worse before it gets better. And yes, um, Boyd in another lifetime has definitely seen addiction issues play out <laughs> with a guy named Charlie. May his soul rest in peace. Anyway, uh, that's a Wasp reference that I can now make, and I'm very happy about that because I've you know, <laughs> watched the series up to this point. Um, yeah, Christy doesn't want to sleep under the same roof as uh, Sarah. Yeah, I don't blame her for that either. Nope. Um, so he, she basically asked to go to Colony House, and Diana's like, the more the merrier. Yeah, which sets us up for where we're going to be next episode mm-hmm. because Mary and Christy are going to show up at Colony House and... There's going to be a question of, why are you here? Well, Donna told us to come. Where's Donna? Right. Yes. Uh, so hopefully maybe that could save her as well. Um, yeah. And while this conversation is going on, Randall is in the background smiling at him. Yeah. So so Randall's snooping or around. not smiling at them. Uh, snooping and spying on them. Yeah. So he, he, I don't know if he knows who that body is, but he knows they're up to something. Right. Well, you know, generally speaking, if you stumble upon people, like, carrying a body out with no explanation, that's going to raise some questions. And I, I'm wondering if this is pushing Randall to think, oh, yeah, I'm seeing something I wasn't supposed to see. Uh. Which he is seeing something he wasn't supposed to be see, but on the complete opposite of where he thought, right? Right. Now, if they actually showed him the body, mm. maybe he'd get it. Right. Because if you see that monster, you know that's not fake. Right. Nope. <laughs> that's a monster. Um, so Donna ends up asking for aspirin for her headache. Yeah, she's like, oh yeah, by the way, so this is what she came for. Right. So at least her presence here is accounted for. Um, and Chrissy says that she doesn't have any. Well, that's kind of interesting. In all that medication, there's not like aspirin or ibuprofen or Yeah, there's anything. gotta be something in there to help her. Right. Boyd suggests a warm compress, and Donna, as she walks off, says, eh, you could just fuck right off. Yeah, she's like, y- you got monster bile, but no aspirin. Right, right. <laughs> 
Uh, we cut to Tabitha and Victor. They open the trunk, and Victor starts to freak out and realizes the drawings are not his. Yeah, so we have a whole new set of drawings to look at, mm-hmm. um, which at the end I want to talk about what we see in some of those drawings. Okay. He remembers a previously unrevealed sister in a voice. His mom wanted him to protect that sister. She left, and her sister went after her. And basically, Victor just kind of sits on the floor and, you know, looks terrified and doesn't do anything. Yeah, so he knew that he had these memories. He knew there was something there he was forgetting. So this this is the third time we've seen this flashback, right? Mm -hmm. The first two times we saw it, it's him trying to remember. It's his memories coming alive. And in this third iteration of it, he sees the true memory. Right. Where... He's not the one that the mom handed the toy to. She handed the toy to Eloise and said to Eloise, do your drawings. She wasn't talking to Victor. Victor wasn't the one doing drawings at this point. Mm. Victor tells us all these drawings in the trunk, they were Eloise's drawings, not Mm. his. He didn't start drawing until after this day. And uh, Victor starts crying and Tabitha ends up comforting a completely distraught Victor. Okay, so let me see. I got a big paragraph here. Let me see what you didn't hit on that I want to say. Okay. Um, okay, again, so now we know about this other character, which is a huge revelation. Yes. Huge, yes. huge revelation. Victor had a sister, which he's completely forgotten about. And it, same as I said about the mother earlier, we don't have confirmation. Did Victor ever find either of their bodies? Not sure. And that's a big question because it's possible... That one or both of them did not die that night. Mm. You know what else is interesting? In that I think maybe perhaps the reason Victor is, you know, uh, hesitant to get really close to Ethan is because of what happened to his sister. Right, right. He blames himself. And mm. he, even if he didn't find his body, he's assuming she died that night. Mm-hmm. And he blames himself because he was supposed to protect her. Yeah. And he just let her walk out of the door and didn't stop her. Right. And he says, I was afraid. I just stayed here. Well, no, you stayed here because your mother told you to stay here. Mm-hmm. And if the girl didn't, that's not your fault. Right. Right. But also, I'm like, she was half a second behind the mother. Why didn't the mother just turn around and put her back in the freaking room? Right. Um. Anyways, I think the most important clue out of the entire episode, possibly the entire series, happens right here. Okay. And it's something that I didn't notice on my first viewer viewing. A Facebook user pointed it out. And um, I saw actually a few different people discussing it. So I didn't accredit that idea to anyone because I'm not sure exactly where it originated. And I may have noticed it on viewings two and three, but I I was told about it after the first viewing. The mom is wearing what appears to be Jim's bracelet. Yes, I did read that comment. And I have a lot to say about that in my theories at the end. We'll get to those. Okay, so we're going to have like another hour after we finish talking about this episode, in other words? Okay. (laughs) Um, but after rewatching this, this scene, every scene I could find of Jim wearing the bracelet, I'm in agreement. I think it's the same. Yeah. Um, I did a Twitter poll asking if it looks the same. And I've got an image, which I'm going to show you now and we'll put up in the video comparing what I could find of Jim's, you know, the best shots I could get of Jim's and of hers. It's hard to get screenshots of the bracelet, you know, out okay, of the video. Okay, so this side is like... So a... everything on the left is images... That's Jim's bracelet okay. in the present day. And the ones on the right is um, the mom's, which okay. she's credited, as, her name's credited as Miranda, the mom. Oh, it's okay. Um, which, you know, I'll talk about that some more later, too. So I did a Twitter poll. 78% of the respondents said they, they are convinced it's the same bracelet. I mean, it looks very similar. 22% said they think it's different. If you look... You can see there's like uh, what looks like kind of a uh, tiger's heart. eye stone, that yeah. color. And then you can see these like gold spacers Mm -hmm. it's definitely very similar if not the same bracelet yeah so if it's the same bracelet it tells us why that bracelet's in the diner Mm -hmm. because it was there in town and ended up somehow going from miranda into the diner yeah it does not explain to us how it ended up in the 1970s when (laughs) tabitha made it in let's say around the year 2000 2005 in that era wow um, that could get real confusing. So, if it's the same, which I'm fairly convinced it is, that hasn't been canonized, of course. But if it's the same bracelet, that would confirm we have a time travel element. 
Yes. To this story. Which many people have suspected. And this is starting to remind me more and more of Dark on <laughs> Netflix, which okay. is a show I've mentioned a lot. Yes. Amazing show. I, I watch it as well. I was put on to it by you. Um, I should really listen to you and your recommendations more often, for I sure. I mean, most, not most, but a big percentage of what you watch is because I told you to, including this show we're talking about. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I gotta say I'm very happy that you put me onto the show because I've been enjoying the hell out of this season. I've been having fun with this podcast. Yeah, so. this has been a, a great experience. And I met the, f- the future lover of my life. Oh my goodness, you're gonna scare her away. <laughs> okay, uh, just Clara. Just so if you're listening, um, if you happen to come on, I will avoid making any kind of marriage proposal. I'm just gonna, <laughs> we'll leave it. Um. So yeah, at the end of our scene by scene, because we're actually pretty close to that. Um. I'll circle back around to talking about some theories that stemmed from thinking about this bracelet. Hmm. Okay. Um, So Donna is approached by Randall, who's apologizing. Yeah, and she's walking home. She's she's just gotten to Colony House. They're standing next to the van. Right. Uh, And he wants to talk, supposedly. I didn't believe him. I didn't think for a minute that he was being sincere here. I, I think that Donna should be more suspicious of this than she actually is. Yeah. And this is the one moment in this episode that Donna is completely wrong. And it cost her big time. And she's like, okay, she agrees to, to talk to him and hear right. him out. And, you know, I, I get it. Like, you know, if someone comes to you apologizing and says they want to talk, you should hear them out. But still, um, I would have been a little bit more suspicious of Randall than she apparently was. Uh, we cut to Benny. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I created a new, new... New ship. Yeah, new ship. Boyd and Kenny. Benny. Benny is um, b- burning smiley. Uh, yep. <laughs> so Boyd and Kenny. Uh, Boyd starts pouring some gasoline on the body. Boyd ends up giving Kenny the honors, and they light Smiley on fire. Yeah, R.I.P. Smiley. That iteration of Smiley is definitely Should we, should we have a moment of silence here? <sighs> I think that would be kind of boring in a podcast, but yes. Uh, so they're having a, bondi, a bonding moment, a very strange one. Yeah, uh, and I feel like you can tell their relationship's starting to mend, right? right. They're opening up to each other, mm-hmm. and um, Kenny admits he's so scared, and I feel like it was a great scene for them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, basically, Kenny says that, you know, he was used to being scared of the monsters coming out of the forest, but this feels very different. You know, something that can hurt you in the dreams, that's just, that's a whole other thing. And Boyd's response is, yup. And, uh, yeah, at first he's like, yeah, I know. And then he's like, yup. So Boyd has a lot of, you know, deep things to say about it in this moment. Um, I think it's more about the fact that he's there to listen. Mm-hmm. And Kenny feels like he can confide in Boyd. Right. Which is good. Yeah. Considering where their relationship's been. I'm glad that they didn't just, like, patch him up completely right away. Yeah. And that they, they slow built it back up like this. I think they did a great job with that. Uh, they did, it, not, it was not instant forgiveness. It was like slowly getting back to this moment. Um, so we cut back to Victor and Tabitha. And they're now sitting on the ground next to the mom's car. They've got all the drawings in front of them, and they're looking at um, Eloise's drawings. Mm-hmm. Um, so And yeah, he blames himself for not protecting his sister. And Tabitha tells him, you were just a little boy. And then she notices a picture of a tower. Yeah, and a Vic- tower specifically that we recognize yes. as the lighthouse. Mm-hmm. Um, you can see the light at the top of it, and Tabitha hasn't seen the lighthouse from the outside, but right. she's seen the inside from that dream of hers. I don't know if she put two and two together, but it definitely struck her that she should ask about this drawing. And Victor just, you know, quietly drops this major league bomb that his mom was going to rescue the children from the tower. Right. That which- Eloise told him, right? Because remember, these are her drawings. Yeah. That this is a drawing of where the mother went that night. She went to save the children locked in the tower. Now, presumably, these are the ghastly children. I'm positive of it. And, and you know, oh, by the way, this episode doesn't provide any answers or nothing happened in this episode. Nothing at all. Nope, nothing at all. This was just another filler. Right. <laughs> uh, all right, so Kenny and Boyd happen by the diner. And Julie, Ethan, and Mrs. Wu are coming out. They are drawn to the sound of cicadas. And a guy exits his house. Reggie. Reggie. I didn't know who this was. Uh, Lily Fox Baby, you know, recognized um, recognized Reggie and remembered that he had a wife. I didn't even yeah, know who so, this guy was so at this all. is um, Reggie and Paula. They're okay. the ones. This, this is Sarah's old house they're coming out of. Uh, right, right. The house okay. that's right next to the diner. 
And they're the couple who took over her house after she left. Mm. Um, I'm pretty sure they came on the bus. Yeah. And um, these are the couple, you know, he's got Nathan's coat. And they're the ones who told Sarah, get the frick out of here or whatever. Um, so that's Reggie that comes out. And I didn't have a name for him before. I remember when we first talked about them. I knew her name. I didn't have his name. But get it from the credits. His name is Reggie. And he comes out of Sarah's old house. He's screaming for help. And he's covered in blood. Now, initially, when I watched the scene, I thought, oh, my God, the cicadas have become man-eating creatures. I don't believe that anymore. It's possible. Like, we, the cicadas are there. Yes. There, there's a reason for their existence. Um, but I don't think they're specifically, like, eating people. Right. I think they might somehow be causing the dreams. Or they just go where the dreams are happening. Right. In some fashion. So, yeah, question. Is this his blood or Paula's? Right. Uh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. Are, did the cicadas attack? Or is it something that happened in a dream? Was Paula dreaming and he found her mm -hmm. covered in blood because she's being attacked in her dream by right. who the frick knows what? Does she see the music box? Yes, that would indicate that now things are expanding beyond the people who Ooh, were immediately And there. actually, on that note, that reminds me, they touched and stole oh, Nathan's yes. coat. Yes. So they could kind of fit in that rhyme, too. Yeah. Um, so maybe um, Reggie is one of the three because, you know, he, he stole and touched. Yeah. And, oh, could they... So this is this is fresh. I don't have notes on this, so so this okay. is me just I will I will bear with this you. This is me not knowing what I'm saying. In your stream of consciousness. But could it all be touch steel take things to do with Sarah? Oh, okay. Kenny broke yeah, the, the ornament. ornament. <laughs> Reggie in her eyes stole the coat. Mm -hmm. Is there somebody else who's wronged Sarah? Touch steel take. Or is that touch Touch, what is the words? It was touch. Touch, break, steal. Right. Touch, break, steal. Stealing the coat, breaking the ornament, touch. Where would that fit in? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I'm just, maybe it's all specific to Sarah, though, if two of the things are related right. to Sarah. And uh, it's quite possible that the wife, uh, I forgot her name already. Uh, yep, Paula. Paula, that she's already dead. It's possible, although she is credited in the next two episodes. Well, yeah, that's interesting. It doesn't actually mean anything. It doesn't mean anything, but, I mean, she's one of those background characters that mm -hmm. we're probably going to see her, if that means. But it yeah. could be we get a flashback on what already happened. Yeah. Or maybe she's super injured right now but not dead yet. Mm -hmm. Who knows? So, yeah, I was thinking, uh, like, this brings me back to my original uh, thought that the cicadas are the rhythm that you have to stop. So you have to, like, somehow get rid of the cicadas. Maybe. So call in an exterminator and solve that problem. <laughs> Who would we call? I don't know. Ghostbusters. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, so so yeah, I think Reggie and Paula, although they're these complete side characters that we know nothing about, they're gonna play some part in us in the next the rest of the season. Mm. Um, and it reminds me of a uh, Lost episode. Now that you're talking, you brought up Lost. I don't know <laughs> if you got there yet because I have no idea when that episode happened with uh, Nikki and Paulo. Oh yeah, uh, I didn't like that episode. <laughs> A lot of people didn't. I'm like, I don't care about these characters. Why are we focusing an entire episode on them? <laughs> oh, good. They're, and they both die before the episode, like early in the episode. But it's a couple that yeah. wasn't important. Suddenly mm. they have something going on. Mm. And and Paulo is, sounds an awful lot like Paula. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, so do we, we did say Mary was possibly the one on the chopping block for stealing, right? I mean, Mary, maybe. Yeah. She's stolen stuff. She has um, seen the music box. Mm -hmm. So, who knows? Yeah. And, you know, maybe if they come for three, maybe there's going to be a lot more than three candidates, but they're going to take three at the end. Makes sense. Okay. And then there's also ideas, of course, that this has nothing to do with three of them, but it's more like got to do with... I've seen ideas that it's got to do with taking the three kids, like they're, they're looking for children, um, and it has somehow links back to the children in the tower. I've seen references that um, Martin and two other bodies were in his dungeon. Mm -hmm. So maybe this has something to do with replacing the three that go on the on the shackles. Gotcha. So I I mean I don't I don't know. All right. So we should we should, we should probably finish <laughs> yeah, this episode this, out so we can get to your the theory. Scene scene. We're right there. <laughs> okay. So Jim goes to this spot where he's supposed to beat up Randall. 
with Randall. And uh, he sees the colony the house van. van is there. And it's like, why is the van here? He sees inside the van. Is that blood that That's he's seeing? That's blood okay. in the back of the van. He calls for Randall, and then he hears Donna's voice. And wouldn't you know it, she's tied to a she's tree. tied to a tree. Her head is bloody. So right. what I gather from that is Randall hit her over the head and threw her in the trunk of the van and brought her here. So Randall asks, I mean, Jim ends up asking, Randall, what the fuck? Right. <laughs> and uh, Randall's all like, new plan. New plan. And that's where the episode ends. Okay, so we have a witch hunt yeah. on now. Randall, I'm assuming what he's doing is he tied Donna up. He wants to leave her out while they mm. sit in the van, in the RV overnight. Yeah. He wants to leave her tied to the tree and watch and see if they kill her. Because so, he thinks she's the mole and no one's going to hurt her because it's all fake. So... The number of people on Facebook that I saw were, first of all, who said that Victor, I mean, not, not Victor, Randall was their favorite. That that was alarming in itself. But were cool with tying a woman to a tree <laughs> was really alarming to me. Like, okay, so not everybody experiences, like, television and movies in the same way. I get immersed in the story. I get immersed in the characters. I, I talk about them like they're real people, and I have the expectation of them being real people. So, but not, not everybody does that. For some people, it's a spectator sport. So they don't really like, if they saw Randall, they wouldn't like him for real. But to them, he's a chaos agent who's causing things to happen. And they wouldn't really be okay with tying a, a potentially innocent woman to a tree and possibly condemning them to death. Right. In real life. But I'm not so sure that's true of everybody that uh, was sent making these type of comments. And that makes me uh, somewhat concerned. Yeah, sure. But <laughs> it's really hard to see how they got out of this situation with nobody dying. Yeah, somebody's dying. I think two of them are dying right. by the time we're said and done with these yeah, two characters. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and I hope Donna's the one to survive yes. out of the three. So, and yeah. I don't know that necessarily that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But that would be my hope. Yeah, I, I hope Donna uh, lives. Or but... maybe we find out she is a mole. I mean, maybe, it's maybe. possible. Yes, it's possible. I don't think so, but... Uh, I, I cannot endorse Randall's actions based on nothing. So, if this plays out the way Randall expects it to, which I don't think it will, because I'm pretty sure they're going to get interrupted mm -hmm. in some fashion, he wants to leave Donna tied to the tree. He wants him and Jim to go sit in the RV. Right. With their talisman and pop some popcorn and, and watch a show. And, um, you know, if she doesn't get killed, that's that's proof to him that right. it's fake and she's the mole. If she doesn't drown, she is exactly. not in fact a witch. And if she gets eaten by monsters, she's proven her innocence and we right. move on. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Um, this kind of makes Randall a sociopath. Uh, yeah. Actually, even not. I wouldn't even say a soci sociopath. A downright now, psychopath. one thing good here is we've seen Jim is not okay with this. So he's not going to just get in the RV and walk. We uh, we got that in the trailer. Um, we saw Jim basically saying, hey, I'm not going to be a party to this. So he's not going to go into the RV and so, sit there with Pop. So, yeah. Around. Is he going to save the day, knock Randall out, save Donna? He could redeem himself for his actions in this episode. He could. He absolutely could. Um, I, we all, I also saw a uh, one of the press photos for episode 9 is Julie talking with um boyd and kenny and it looks to me like she's telling them something and i'm wondering if she's telling on the fact that her dad told her he's spending the night in the rv and maybe some help comes before right. something terrible happens so um if donna doesn't make it then randall should absolutely 100 percent, no question go into the damn box oh yeah um and also you know we have that that setup where Christy and Mary are going to go to Colony House and Donna's not there. Right. And remember, it's going to be up to them now to convince all of those people that they have to sleep in shifts and watch for their dreams. Yikes. Yeah. At least um, at Colony House, we do have Fatima and Ellis who know about the monster. They don't know about the whole dream scene. Well, yet. there's Elgin who's experienced it. Right, so, okay. so Fair maybe enough. they've got their own conversation going about this and mm -hmm. that might be okay, but this could potentially be a horrible night for a lot of people well we're pretty close to the finale and so our boyd and uh kenny still gonna try the silver bullet thing tonight like <laughs> i think that's a way too much plot to happen in the next two episodes for sure so um, i don't know there's a lot yeah yeah so i did another twitter poll okay and um i asked you know for donna here because last week 
she got to call uh elizabeth saunders got to call her husband cliff saunders who plays dale she got to call him a fuckwad <laughs> and i said to twitter who's the bigger fuckwad dale or randall okay so in my opinion yeah, let's get it, your opinion it's definitely randall okay like yeah dale was out of his mind and i don't necessarily think that what happened to ellis was a total accident it looks like he deliberately thrust a knife in Ellis's general direction. At the same time, this is Randall not in a tense situation. This is just Randall being Randall as far as I'm concerned. Dale is under a lot of pressure, and so he reacts badly under that pressure. Right. I don't think this is who Dale actually is you okay. know, in a calmer situation. In Randall's case, I think that's who he is. Yeah, so the internet agreed with you. Really? Staggering results, 5% picked Dale, hmm. 95% of respondents said it's Randall. And I think this is good news for Dale because I feel like the Frummelly is just kind of ready to forgive him. Yeah. And um, probably Sarah as well, right? Mm-hmm. We've got our eyes on a bigger evil now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, you know, recency bias, Randall would be uh, the, yeah, of course. the one to create the worst situation currently. So, is there a mole? I don't believe so. Could Donna be the mole? I don't believe so. And like, I, I, like I've seen too many of her weak moments. I've seen her by herself, throwing plants around, right. in frustration. Exactly. There's been moments where there's no one to put a show on for. Right. Except us, the audience. Right. Now, Randall, Randall didn't notice that. Or, I mean, he wasn't around to see it. Jim didn't see that. Right. But the bottom That's the whole point. It's when people aren't right. around, how do right, you act? Right. Fatima walked in on that, but I don't know that she necessarily saw anything. Uh, Boyd ended up coming in on a similar situation. Mm -hmm. I don't know that he saw anything necessarily. But like I said, that's the fact that those those events happened when there was nobody else around to watch leads me to believe that Donna is not in fact a mole. Right. And that Randall is currently just tying an innocent woman up to a tree. Reasons that we can see why Randall is suspicious of her. We know from other scenes. There's a reason she was in all of these places when she right, was. Right, right. They're all explained. All They're all explained. accounted for. Yeah, okay. So could Randall be the mole? Could he be a plant brought in to stir chaos? Clara thought so. Uh, Clara, uh, you know, I mentioned her theory at the top. She thought that Randall was the mole. Clara, the viewer, not uh, Clara at Colony House. Right. Who we haven't seen in a few episodes. Right. Um, so, yeah, she, she seems to think that he's the mole. I, I see her point of view. Uh, some people also agree with that. Uh, I think that's a strong possibility. But also, again, I don't think there is a mole. I, I, I tend to think, I agree with you, that um, there's not. Because I don't think this is an experiment. Right. I don't think we're just dealing with human interaction. Mm-hmm. I think there's definitely something... Supernatural. Yes, absolutely. Extraordinary mm-hmm. happening here. Yeah. And uh, we finally got uh, a reason for all that dream right. music to, and uh, indications um, towards dreams. That yeah, we got all so season long. all season long, starting with the season two promo, mm-hmm. Dream a Little Dream of Me. Yeah. They've been pushing us to dreams early in our season discussion. We outline all of the times dreams have been mentioned throughout Mm -hmm. the series and i said then yeah they're pointing to dreams but i don't think it's as simple as somebody's dreaming right here we go we got the we're pointed to dreams because dreams are now an important plot point Mm -hmm. because your dreams are coming alive so that's why we were pushing towards dreams Hmm. and the other thing they're really pushing us towards in the advertising this season is phobias Interesting. Um, I don't know how that plays in, but every episode they're putting out on their socials, like a scene from the series, plus like what phobia it could be linked to. Maybe Kenny has a uh, a fear of cicadas for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So are you good with the the play by play? Yeah, we... I think uh, okay. we're we're good with that. So we can get into your okay. Uh, your comments. I want to talk about the bracelet. Okay. Okay. And something that I can't believe I didn't pick up on before that I now realized about this bracelet. Because we talked about the bracelet before. The bracelet came up in season one. I mean, we didn't cover season one the way we're covering season two. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that might be why, you know, we haven't come back to it. Because it really hasn't played a part this season. Right. But it's back in the back of our minds that, yeah, 
Tabitha found this bracelet, how to get here? And that's been a question, but it's been kind of on the back burner. Right. And I feel like everybody's kind of looked at it and thought in a linear fashion, like, oh, well, it went missing when Julie was born. Somebody found it. That person ended up in Frumville in the last umpteen years mm -hmm. and brought the bracelet with them. Right. And if Victor's mother had the bracelet, that's not the case. No. Nope. There's something bigger and timey-wimey happening here, which I'm all for. Yeah. You know, that sure. excites me. That's mm -hmm. what I'm ready to, like, dig into theories. Let's talk time travel. All right, let's do it. All right, so the bracelet is a bootstrap paradox. And that's what I can't believe I didn't see before. It's literally made out of Jim's father's boot laces. Like, how much more obvious could they make it when they introduced it to us? The bracelet itself is a paradox. Interesting. Okay, so a bootstrap... Bootstrap paradox. I'll read you the uh, definition. And it's interesting because I've never heard of that, and I'm a science fiction fan. Okay, well, you've watched Dark, so you should have heard about it because they explain bootstrap paradox in detail in Dark. Okay, I, I have memory problems these days. <laughs> right. I kind of being an old I'll read man. the description, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So, the boot docs, bootstrap paradox is a hypothetical causal loop in time travel. Yep. Hypothetical causal loop in time travel in which one event causes a second, which was actually the cause of the first. Oh, okay. So it's the concept of time travel loops, something right. that is inexplicable without time travel. Uh, yeah, I've heard of this concept before, just not explained in that way. So in Dark, yeah. which I won't get too deep into, but there were several bootstrap paradoxes in Dark. Um, the book... Okay, the scientist wrote a book, except he never wrote it. Somebody handed it him, his own book to him. Right. And that launched all of the time travel. The time travel um, blueprints themselves came from nowhere. Mm -hmm. About 75% of the characters themselves were bootstrap paradoxes, where they should not have been alive. Right. And as that show, and I'm not going to get into the details, but if, if you haven't watched that, go watch it. Because if you're listening to us, you're going to love that show. Promise. Oh, absolutely. Um, by the time you get to the end of it, it's all explained of how it happened and how, you know, how it was all linked to something outside of the loop. Mm -hmm. But once you get into this time loop, these things all don't exist without each other. Right. And it's, you know, a paradox within time travel. And so here we are, the paradox of the bracelet. The origin of the bracelet is Tabitha made it for Jim out of his father's uh, boot laces. And he lost it in the hospital the night Julie was born, which is, what, 16 to 18 years ago. Yep. And um, so we can presume it was made in the early 2000s. Okay. Okay. That's the origin of the bracelet. And this is all, of course, assuming it's the same bracelet. Right. Which Tabitha seemed pretty convinced the one she found in Frumville was the same bracelet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it's just a question of, is that the bracelet that Miranda is wearing, the mother? Um, so if it is, it confirms time travel. The bracelet traveled through time, probably with a person or people. Okay. Okay. So we do have a missing step and I don't have an answer for this. How did it physically get from the hospital in the early 2000s into Frumville to be in the diner? And I don't know the answer to that. I don't have theories specifically on that step, but I feel confident we're going to get that answer in episode 10. Okay. So basically, the bracelet gets lost. Someone has to find it. Travel back through time to from Bill, 1970s. Or even earlier than that. Well. Or actually, it doesn't even, it doesn't even need to go back to from Bill. It just needs to get to uh, Victor's mother. Right. So that bracelet travels back through time, ends up in Victor's mother's hands, and then she ends up in Frumville. Right. Which yeah. is a step I didn't get too deep in. Right. Most of my theories kind of go the other way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but and you, if we're talking time loops, then mm -hmm. you could go around and around and around forever and you're not going to unsolve it. Right. Um, but I think we're going to get to know what happened in the hospital. We're going to get that part of this story. In episode 10, which is called Once Upon a Time. I did note that. And I think we've talked about yeah, that Yeah, we once. talked about that yeah. when we were comparing to Lost and Once Upon a Time. Right. Um, listed so far on IMDb for that episode, we have a nurse character and a doctor character. Okay. 
So I think that that means we're going to get that hospital scene. I think we're going to talk about the bracelet. All right. So I'm interested that the the doctor and the nurse character, not the same as the nurse that we've seen no as a ghost not not, uh, not the same actress not monster not the same actress okay not listed as a monster we got someone listed as a nurse we got someone listed as actually the nurse is male okay so i mean there's a lot of places they could go with that obviously it could be new people coming it could be flashbacks to people that were in the town before it could literally be anything mm-hmm. but my personal theory right now is that's going to relate to the bracelet and the night julie was born okay 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 so yeah, I think we'll we'll get answers to that. So I'm not really going to talk about, you know, how did we get from the hospital to here. Okay. All right. My theories all kind of stem from starting that moment in the root cellar. Okay. Okay. So Miranda has the bracelet. That's where I'm starting my theories. All right. Okay. So I have what I'm calling my uh, dark slash La Brea theory one. Being that both those theories, both those shows involve, like, people being other people and related to other people in cr- crazy time travel ways. Okay. Okay. Theory one. And all these theories don't fit together. They're all separate. Julie is Victor's mom. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here's, in this theory, here's what happens next from where we are today. Jim dies, which that's plausible. Yes. Julie. Likely, takes, actually. Julie takes her father's bracelet. Jim's wearing the bracelet right now. Julie takes the bracelet, and now it's hers. Mm -hmm. Okay. At some point in the future of this show, Julie gets out through a faraway tree or through some other means, but instead of going home, she lands in, like, the 1960s. Okay. Okay. And she has to now assume a fake identity. She becomes Miranda. Okay. Okay. And at some point in the next several years, she has two children. Any particular idea why she would choose that name? No. Okay. Just, we, we got to change a name. Yes. Okay. All right. So she has two children. And I'm not sure if they meant for Victor and Eloise to be twins. I kind of think they might be. They looked about very, the same very size. Very similar. Yeah. So in this theory, um, she names her son Victor, naming him after her friend Victor from Frumville. Okay. Okay. And uh, not realizing at this point exactly that she's given birth to the exactly, show? and she names her daughter Eloise, and I even have a theory for that because in this scenario, Jim's dead. I think Victor and Tab no, <laughs> Jade and Tabitha get together. I'm I'm hoping J- uh, Victor and <laughs> Tabitha don't get together because that would really make things screwy. Stay with me here. Okay. So in this reality. Tabitha and Jade have gotten together, right? All Team right. Jabitha, I'm there. Do they have any kids? Uh, no, no. Okay. But um, so Jade's now close to Julie, right? He's he's her stepfather. They're close, and Jade we know is uh, French. Yes. And so maybe the name Eloise is somebody who was important to him. I'm not saying this child. I'm saying the name Eloise is his. We talked about his grandmother before. Okay. Maybe he starts talking about someone named Eloise, and that name was important. And maybe that's where uh, Julie gets the name Eloise from. Okay. So she names her kids Victor and Eloise. All right. And um, now I'm curious, have you actually looked at uh, Victor's mother in these scenes? Did she look similar to Julie to you? I mean, she could. Yeah, okay. (laughs) I'm just curious if you watch them again with that theory in mind. Listen, anything's possible in these theories because she's a decade or more older. I mean, more than a decade because she's got kids that are 10. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay. So she lives her, this new life. She kind of starts to forget about her, her past and, and she's Miranda and she's a great mom. And then all of a sudden we get to 1978 and they come upon a fallen tree. Mm. And she realizes in that moment. She's back in Frumville. She's back in Frumville and she realizes who her kids are. Yes. And she is now stuck here and bam, that's where we're at. Okay. And that's why Miranda has the bracelet on because it's really Julie who's been wearing her dad's bracelet her whole life. Well, that's really interesting. Makes sense. And I think that's my favorite of all the ones I wrote. Yeah, so far for me, but then you've only shared one theory so far. Okay. So, second one, I'm not as as um hooked on this theory, but I was trying to come up with another reason of how this bracelet could get could get where it's at, right? And this theory goes along with what you said. Well, I don't think Miranda is 
Julie, right? I think she's a whole different character. Here's what I think could be this case then. Maybe Ethan is Christopher. Okay. Okay. So in this theory, same thing. Jim dies, except this time Ethan takes his father's bracelet and starts wearing it. All right. Okay. And in this timeline, Ethan is the one who gets out through a tree and time travels to the 1960s. Interesting. Okay. And he changes his name to Christopher. Does he forget that uh, when he was a kid, he was sort of involved in this situation <laughs> and uh, would know something about the symbols? I, I don't know. Hmm, okay. I'm talking about a bracelet here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so he, his fake identity becomes Christopher for whatever reason. And by 1978, he's all grown up. Who knows what's going on in his life, but he travels to Fromville, finds the fallen tree. Once he's here, he meets Miranda and her kids. And maybe they get close. Maybe he has a relationship with Miranda. And he Aww. gives Miranda his dad's bracelet. Cute. And that's why she has the bracelet, because Christopher gave it to her. You see, Elgin, that's how it's done. <laughs> So, and maybe at this point he realizes who her son is and the whole shebang. Mm hmm Okay. And um, then he starts to see the symbol and, and goes crazy and doesn't make people smile anymore. Aw. Yeah, sad. And then everybody dies. Yeah. So I, I don't himself. love that theory, but if you don't like Julie being uh, Miranda... Maybe Ethan's Christopher. I don't know. I kind of like your first theory better. So I, I do like the first theory better. Now, if Jim dies and one of his kids takes that bracelet, mm -hmm. I'm sticking with it. Okay. All right. My next theory is that it's not actually the same bracelet. Okay. And this one doesn't actually require any time travel either. <laughs> but this is a theory that's induced by these scenes. And this is what I've seen people actually have. Those first two, I haven't seen anyone say those, but I've seen people talk about this one. Maybe Tabitha is Eloise. Okay. And no time travel involved in this one, but I'll tie it back into the bracelet as we go here. So we're back in the root cellar. Eloise follows her mother, and she doesn't die in the massacre. Okay. Now, Victor doesn't know this because he blames himself for her death, but the body never showed up. He doesn't know what happened to her, but guess what? She got out. Mm-hmm. Eloise got out. No time travel this time. She just got out of Fromville. And maybe the mom, too. I don't know. That's not really relevant to this theory, whether the mom made it or not. Just the fact that Eloise gets out. And she would have to get out at this point. Otherwise, she would have memories. Right. So Eloise gets out. And um, she grows up. She blocks everything out. Just like Victor blocked everything out. Or just forgets because she's young enough that right. it's possible. And eventually, for whatever reason, she starts going by the name Tabitha. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's her middle name. Maybe. Maybe whatever. Um, maybe she was an orphan and they changed her freaking name. Okay. I mean, that's possible. Yep. She's going by Tabitha, marries Jim, has her three kids. She's blocked away all these memories. But, you know, now that she's here, they're slowly starting to come back to her. She's starting to kind of recognize things. Maybe that's what her dreams are about. And um, this is supported by the pact. Remember when uh, Jade showed her the Polaroid? She instantly recognized that's Victor. Right. So maybe that's a hidden memory in her head. Of course she knows that's Victor because she knows Victor because she's the sister. Right. Oh. And um, if Eloise was trying to help her mom save the kids in the tower in the 70s, maybe that's why they're appearing to her now because she already has a connection to them. Okay. And it could even explain something that I didn't really pick up on. But remember when they were in the caves and um, there was that World's Fair suitcase? Yes. And she was... Um, oh, and she picked up the dress. And she seemed kind of interested. And people were saying, oh, there's something connecting Tabitha to that suitcase. And I didn't really pick up on that. But this could even explain that because maybe it belonged to their mother. Who in this, you know, Victor's mother absolutely could have been at... 1964 World's Fair, given their timeline. Yeah, that makes and sense. And maybe that was uh, Miranda's suitcase, and maybe she recognized this in some way because this came from her family. Okay. And um, so in this theory, like I said, it's not the same bracelet, but what happened is Tabitha remembered this bracelet mm -hmm. in her head and kind of designed the same bracelet for Jim, unconscious, subconsciously. Right. And, you know, it's the same style bracelet that, you know, either her mother made or maybe she even made it for her mother when she was a kid. 
and it just kind of looks the same. Now that is kind of contradicted by um, how positive Tabitha seemed that it's the bracelet based on it has the same flaws. But you know what? Maybe she made the same mistake both times and they both have the same flaw. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so yeah, not totally convinced, but if you're looking for something that doesn't involve time travel, that's my theory. Okay. How do you feel about that one? Interesting. Yeah, and, and people, you know, a lot of people um, said maybe she's Eloise and it's it's possible. She could be. It's, it's possible. Here's an image. Hmm. Of, of you know, them together. Yeah, I could see it. And she's probably about the right age. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. All right, so theory four that I have on my sheet. Similar line of thinking, but has nothing to do with the bracelet. We, we're we off the bracelet topic now. Okay. That's just what led to this whole stream of thought. All right. Maybe Eloise is Abby. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, at this point, like... Every time you produce a new theory, it's like, all right. Just hear me out. Okay. So, just like the last theory, Eloise somehow survived this night and got out of Fromville. Okay. She grows up, and now she's going back to the name Abby. Again, for whatever reason, name change. And then, you know, she lives her life, as we know Abby did. Marries, meets Boyd. Meets Boyd. Spends her life in the military, because maybe that's where an orphan's going to end up. Makes sense. Right? And, you know, they have their son and whatever, whatever. She kind of forgets about this the same way, you know, I suggested Tabitha might. The same way Victor pushed all these memories away. Didn't even remember he had his sister. Right. And he's been here the whole time. So yeah, he hasn't gone anywhere. It's not implausible that if you got out as a child, you'd forget all this well, I mean, and how, think it was a dream. How old are these kids at this point? Eight or ten. And I think it's certainly possible to just forget things when you get older. Right. Or kind of... When like... your whole life changes so drastically. Right. Um, so, when she gets to Fromville, she remembers this dream she had as a little girl. Remember Abby mentioning that? Ah, uh, yes. She yes. mentioned this dream she had as a little girl. And could that not be her own childhood memories? Mm -hmm. Just the way that Victor thought all of this these memories was a dream. Mm. And she starts shooting everybody to wake them up. Well, yeah, <laughs> but but my whole thought that she could be Abby is simply based on Abby saying, I remember this dream I had as a little girl, and this all felt very familiar to her. All right. And maybe she was here as a little girl. Yeah. And it says nothing again. I have no link to the bracelet and how that would tie here, but. And no time travel. On this no time either. travel. But it just reminded me of Abby's dream, which is something we haven't got back to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, now one fan theory that would break all of this is that Eloise is one of the ghoulish kids. That she didn't get out. So she ended up trapped in the tower. She ended up one of the kids trapped in the tower. And there's this image that they have that's going around. Uh, that explains why you had that image. That explains why that image. This one here I'm going to show you. And um, um, a lot of people are saying those look like the same person. However, IMDb is clearly listing them as separate actresses. Now, could IMDb be wrong? Sure, they could. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not seeing the resemblance necessarily. So and... I don't think they're the same, but I wanted to throw that out there because I know it is something a lot of people are talking about. Okay. Um, I didn't write down the actress's name playing Eloise, but she's clearly credited. As something different than the ghastly and child. it's confusing with the ghastly children because there's so many of them. But that actress is not credited as a ghastly child. And if I recall, before we met, like, the ten children that we ended up meeting, when it was just the two kids that Tabitha kept seeing, yeah. um, it was a boy's name, which that's the, the taller blonde kid. Yes. And then a girl's name, and that was Isabel something. Okay. So I'm pretty sure this actress is whichever ghoulish child number is played by Isabel. Okay. And that would tell us these are definitely two different people. Yes. So I don't support that theory at all, but I wanted to bring it up because I know people are talking about it. So I don't think that um, that ghoulish child we've met is her. Now, does that mean she didn't die in the tower? Of course not. Maybe she dies in the tower. Maybe she's still <laughs> a ghoulish child. We just didn't necessarily yeah. see her. Right. And I've also seen theories that um, Miranda and or Eloise are still in the tower or mm -hmm. the lighthouse specifically. Right. Who's at the lighthouse? Right. Somebody's there. 
Like, the light is going off, and the horn is going off. Somebody's there. Right. It could still be conceivably alive. I mean... Right, exactly. Uh, exactly. Miranda would be kind of old at this point, but she'd still conceivably be alive, for right. sure. Right, absolutely. Um, and um, throughout all these theories, I don't know which ones it fits with, but I still have in the back of my mind that maybe Jade is Victor's brother. Yes. I'm still holding on to that. So, again, throughout each of these theories, I don't know where that fits, but... Again, Eloise is a French name. Right. Definitely not in the first theory. I don't think that would fit with uh, Victor being Jade's brother in that scenario, necessarily. Why? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a justification <laughs> for that. <laughs> so, Victor, Jade could be the baby brother of Victor and Eloise that okay. wasn't on this trip. Okay. And that still could be plausible, except... I'm not putting him in a romance with Tabitha in that in that scenario. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. But um That'd be kinda weird. But it seems notable that we know Jade has this French connection. Mm -hmm. Was raised in France by his grandmother, and Eloise is very clearly a French name. Yeah, so that fits that theory. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, I don't know where that would leave my whole uh Jabitha shipping. <laughs> but um I still, I still, I want them to be brothers. I feel that still. Okay. Mm hmm And uh, that's all I got for theories. All right. For you, the moment. Okay. You got anything um, else? Yes. And I just wanted to speak a little bit about the pictures. All right. So we got a oh, whole yes. new set of pictures, Eloise's pictures. And as if we didn't have enough of Victor's pictures to analyze, right, that we see all the time, we got a whole new set of pictures. And I, I compiled some of them. These are ones we saw in the trunk. And the lighthouse, of course. So, of course, the lighthouse, like we talked about that. And that's going to become um, something in the next episode. Well, one of them I recognize is the tower. That's the that's one that they draw right, your attention to. Right, the lighthouse there. This looks like police officers or something? I'm pretty sure this one on the bottom left of my compilation here is the Civil War soldiers. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she saw the Civil War soldiers. Right. And we've got a bus. Yes. Oh, did she, like, see that in the future? Possibly. I don't know. Premonition? Of, you know. Um, we've got the bottle tree. Yes. That Boyd and Sarah found in season one. Mm -hmm. Very clearly an image of that. And we've got an image that looks like somebody shooting a bunch of people, kind of Abby style. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see that. It's somebody holding a gun, and there's at least two people on the other end of it. Well, we always had the theory that Victor saw the future. There was a theory that Victor saw the future, and then I feel like Victor himself has kind of shot that down by saying he draws what he sees so he remembers it, and the pictures are memories. It could also be things he sees, premonitions. It could be, um, but he hasn't supported that no. at all. Um, but there's also the fact maybe Eloise saw visions of the future, but he doesn't. Right. Maybe she sense. draws the future, he draws the present. Okay. Um, there's also the whole concept, you know, of... Things are repeating themselves. Yes. Not necessarily an actual time loop that we're stuck in from a dark style. Yes. But the we fact... Have the, uh, we have the cycle. The fact that there's a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. That started with two vehicles coming at the same time. And probably crashing because they, we've seen this picture of Victor hat. One of his pictures is two vehicles crashing into each other. And it's not an RV. This is... I'm sure meant to symbolize the first two vehicles that he stopped referencing but referenced a lot last season. Okay. And, um, like, I don't know, other things have just seemed to be repeating. And he seems to know what's going to happen because he saw the last cycle happen. Right. So, are these all pictures Eloise made of things that happened in the last cycle? Right? Oh, okay. So, you're saying these events happened again. Similar basically. events happened in the, in the 70s. Gotcha. Um, a bus. Maybe it wasn't necessarily a bus, like, like what happened here, but it was a large vehicle with a bunch of people in it. Right. Um, maybe even the van. Mm -hmm. How old is that van? I don't know anything about cars. Is that a 70s model? I couldn't really tell you. But <laughs> it could be, right? Yeah, it could. That definitely could be a picture of a van with a bunch of people in it. Yeah. Um, the bottle tree. And it, there was the whole thing of, well, she said the tower, the, the lighthouse is where her mother was going. Did she physically travel there 
Where did she end up in a faraway tree? The way, possibly? you know, Boyd and oh, Sarah yeah, yeah, yeah. traveled and, and saw this tree along the way. Mm -hmm. Are they the ones who put the bottles in the tree? Maybe. Civil War soldiers. Was she seeing premonitions and visions the way Jade is and Jade saw the Civil War soldiers? Possibly. Or did somebody tell her about them and she drew them? Or maybe there were Civil War soldiers <laughs> in Frumville for some reason. Or maybe she actually time traveled to the 1860s. Yeah. Or, like, why is she drawing these things? These are things to, that we got to contemplate now. Yeah. Right? All of these images are a whole nother set of, of things. Questions. Lots of questions. And somebody shooting people. Is she premonitioning Abby? Or did that same thing happen too? Did Christopher shoot everybody? That's what I was just going to ask. Is like, Was Christopher basically shooting everybody dead, saying that they should wake up from the dreams? Right. Like, what happened? Mm -hmm. And maybe in Once Upon a Time, we'll get some more context to what was going on in the 70s. Yeah, I mean, that would suggest that, I mean, the title suggests that they're going to talk about the past. The past, right. Yeah. So. Um. Then again, like, it could be misleading. Yeah, yeah. It could be. Like, this, most episodes of this season, we've been able to say, like, the title, there's a literal meaning, and then we can find all these figurative ones. In this episode, I don't see a literal meaning, other than we're talking about, like, this whole chaos theory. Right. I don't see a literal meaning. I was expecting there to be trees involved in this episode, and there weren't. I mean, they were in the forest at one point. Yeah, but, like, I expected there to be a plot point involving yeah. trees. Yes. Like, maybe another faraway tree, and that didn't happen, so... No, nope, no. Nope. So maybe they're not all going to be, like, multi-layered. Okay. Other than they're telling us, look at the big picture. Right, and that they, the characters should be doing that as well. Yeah, and I feel like it's hinting that we're going to start seeing some big picture stuff. And with the bracelet... I'm guessing or hoping that Victor's going to see Jim's bracelet, maybe in episode 9, mm -hmm. maybe in episode 10. He's going to see Jim's bracelet and recognize it. Mm. And well, give us a confirmation that it's not just a totally separate prop and this is all, like, nothing. Right, right. <laughs> give us something that he recognizes the bracelet. Well, that would be a half hour of talking about something <laughs> that uh, just turned out to be, oh, we reused a prop. But I, I don't think the creators do that in this series. Um... Yeah, I expect him to recognize the bracelet, and like I said, when we are talking about doctors and nurses, I feel like that's hinting towards the night Julie was born and Jim lost the bracelet. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. You got anything else? I, I think that's it. Amazing, well, right? Yeah, we uh, <laughs> we saw some uh, some trailer images from the, the uh, trailer, and it's interesting to note that Kenny and Sarah are going to share a scene next week. Okay, I don't know if I actually analyzed the trailer. I recorded no. the trailer. I shared the trailer. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I actually, like, really absorbed it. Yeah, we have uh, Jim arguing with Randall, and we see yeah. Kenny and Sarah talking. Okay. Do you uh, know where they were talking? Probably the sheriff's office. Kind of looked like it. Oh, that makes sense, because Boyd said he's yeah. going to bring Sarah there. Mm -hmm. So maybe they uh, kind of come to a peaceful understanding of some type. Or at least have a... A more healthy conversation? Yes. <laughs> um, I definitely think people are going to die next week. The other thing that was in that trailer, I do remember. Yes. Abby. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we had that uh, moment. And it looks like Boyd is going to the RV specifically. Um, so he's act actually at the RV, which means he's going to end up showing okay, up. Okay. I, I don't know if I caught that. Yeah. I thought I saw him like he entering the RV. somewhere. And who was there was uh, Spiderweb Abby. Yes. Abby trapped in those spider webs, which is the last place we saw that actress. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it was left. Was that just some weird vision? Was it actually Abby he was talking to? Or something trying to make him think it was Abby? Mm -hmm. And we're there again, where we have Abby talking to Boyd. Mm. So we got two episodes left. You can safely assume that a lot of stuff is about a to go down. A lot of stuff is about to go down. And I think it's going to be amazing. And I think our conversations are going to be long the next couple of weeks. Oh, unlike this one, which is like <laughs> sitting at about almost two and a half hours. Yeah, I think we're just over two. <clears throat> it's hard to say because we're, you know, recording in, in, in chunks. But... Yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, my voice is just about gone <laughs> at this point. Uh, you have anything else to add? I, I think I think that's it. I think I'm excited for next week. Me too. Me too. And um, we'll have a lot to talk about then. Yeah. Um, so we would like to hear from you. You got any theories? You got any comments about what we said in the podcast? Yeah, what do you think about all of my crazy theories? Let me have it. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, maybe you know, vote for which answer you like the best. Uh, give us your feedback. We will definitely shout you out if you mention uh, some kind of theory in the comments or anywhere, really. You can find us. Uh, you can find uh, Trace. Uh, wow. Not <laughs> Thanks, Dave. We've only been friends for 20 years. <laughs> uh, you can. You can reach Stacy at. I can be found on Twitter at TVN Coupon Talk. Tracy happens to be my boss, by the way, so <laughs> mixing up the names there. <laughs> the women in my life. All right, so if you like this podcast and want to support it, there are a number of ways to do so. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Core Productions. You can join one of my Corn Productions Facebook pages. You can buy something from the Corn Productions store on Zazzle. You can buy me a coffee, which is a new way to support content creators such as ourselves. And of course, you can like, share, and comment on this podcast, as well as subscribing to our channel. Remember, Stacy, when we get to a million, uh, a million <laughs> subscribers, we'll eat a fried cicada live on air. This is Dave and Stacy from Porn Productions signing off.